welcome to you all to the Elborn Center for Culture and Memory. This is the venue, the facility at the heart of memorial policies of the Barcelona City Council, despite being in your own, own homes, because unfortunately we are not able to travel or to uh, go elsewhere. So despite you being at home, you are now also at El Bon Cultural Center at La Ribera neighborhood in Barcelona. And thank you for being here today. This is a day for reflection and a day for th rethinking and rethinking the concept of Stolpersteiner. I would like to thank all the people at Elborn for all their great efforts in order for today's session to uh, become true under these difficult circumstances. And also thanks to you, Katrin, the curator of this session, for your willingness and for your enthusiasm in preparing today's session. Today, we're going to talk about Stolpersteiner. We believe that we have to open a discussion on public art, on everything that needs to be recognized, acknowledged, remembered. And we want to do so in a physical manner in our cities. Public art belongs to everybody. Doesn't belong to politicians or to the people who decide what to put on public space. The, and this deserves an open debate, an open discussion for everyone. Because even though art usually is present on our streets and public space, it is important for us to question whether everything that is on the public space is representatively representative enough of our uh, area. In Barcelona, we have a lot of monuments, we have a lot of public art that's been there for decades, and we need an ongoing discussion regarding everything that needs to be remembered and commemorated. So, first of all, public art is a topic for discussion, an ongoing discussion for and by everybody. Today, we're focusing on the Stolpersteiner. This is the monument, the memorial. We mentioned earlier the concept micro monuments. Well, Stolpersteiner is the micro monument which has, which is widest or uh, present in the world. And since Barcelona already has a great deal of public art in its public space, we cannot deny that this is a humble, discreet, small monument that however, has a great impact because Barcelona, of course, has its own signal policy. Should we ask whether this is valid or not? No, this is not our topic for discussion. In our different panels, we are going to ask ourselves about the impact of Stolpersteiner in uh, a city that already implements its policy on public art. So I would like to thank all the speakers for their willingness uh, for participating in the different panels and sessions that we've prepared for you today. Catherine is going to explain them in a bit. We're going to focus on Stolpersteiner in general terms, but also their impact in the city of Barcelona. And at the Department of Democratic Memory, at Barcelona City Council, we are very happy for this session to be a reality and for you to be with us. Catherine or will mention that, but we have more than 100 attendees from all over the world. And uh, of course, we are very happy about that. Today, panels, have been conceived in order for us to uh, draw some conclusions, conclusions that will be useful to the Barcelona City Council and our department and others in how will these micro monuments will uh, be implemented in its policy. So I would like to thank all the panelists for being here with us. And now I'm going to uh, 
give the floor uh, back to Catherine, who's going to explain uh, the logistics and the program of today's conference. Thank you very much. Well, it is a great pleasure for me to be here today. And as Jordi already said, we have participants from practically all over the world, from Greece, from Canada, from Chile, from Spain, of course, from Catalonia, from Barcelona. They are all uh, joined us here today. This opening to the world, this openness is the positive aspect of online events that allow us uh, or that do not allow us to gather uh, face to face, something that we've been missing now for uh, a long time, really, with the pandemic. Today, we are here to talk about the city, about shared spaces, about how to uh, talk about uh, memorials. There are new shapes of memorials besides the classical uh, memorials. We are really interested in the discussion on how do we uh, pay tribute. Actually, we started this discussion about two and a half years ago in the dialogues City and Memory. Some of the panelists of today's panelists already took part back then. Today, we're talking about a micro monument, 10 by 10 centimeters, uh, coming especially from Germany, but that can be found in many, many cities worldwide. worldwide. It was created by the German artist Günther, Günther Denmick at, as a parallel movement to the political policies regarding the uh, Nazi policies with the aim to duly represent the impact of the Holocaust and the genocide. So today we have to ask us uh, the, about the dimensions of these projects when expanding and opening to other victim uh, groups. This is a very important discussion in our current era where codes overlap and languages are replaced. I think that in order to have uh, or that today is of great essence, considering anti-Semitism and the um, and and the existence of uh, far-right movements, to have an an open debate. We should also agree that we won't agree uh, at one hundred percent, despite despite uh, the size of the monument. Of course, we have to listen to uh, voices who think differently in order to build uh, our world. Of course, we are not going to agree all the time with everybody. It, but today it's about understanding memory and to identify collective memory as a democratic commitment, which compels not only politics, but also citizens. As Jordi mentioned earlier, it's something that should concern um, society as a whole. Barcelona is strongly committed in that regard, multi-dimension uh, committed, focused in its uh, different neighborhoods and also across cutting memories. So the session is going to be divided into three different pa panels that will include a presentation of the evolution of the Stolpersteiner project. We're going to talk about the aim of this project in order to engrave the memory of the deported in the city of Barcelona. And we're going to talk also about the expectations of civil society organizations that represent uh, deported and other victims. And also we're going to look for a memorial gesture that wants to highlight and um, to be highlighted in the European debate. We will have uh, three different panels with uh, from between three and six panelists. Please, I kindly ask you to stick to the uh, to your time so that we will have time at the end for a Q&A session. We're going to start our first panel in two minutes, then the second at 5.05. The second table is going to talk about the case of Barcelona. We listen from the institution and from civil uh, society organizations. And the third panel will be open at 6.50. It will be devoted to the Republican memory. And we will have 20, a 20 minute break between one table and the next one in order to allow for the proper function functioning of the meeting. 
First of all, I would like to thank the Department for Democratic Memory for this initiative and for trusting me for this project to Angel Llorenz and also Mike Safon. These people have supported me in a great manner. Also, I would like to thank the whole team uh, of At El Born, Eva Bonet, Mark Ross, and all the technicians who are doing a wonderful job. Also, the team of interpreters, Monse and Tomas, who will be enabling this debate for everyone, and uh, Aida, who's going to gather your questions and comments. So now we're going to open with our first panel. And please let me thank some, thank Charlotte Gnoblau. She's a survivor of the Holocaust as an honorary uh, or former president of the Jewish uh, or the, the Central Council of Jews in Germany and the Jewish community and of Munich and the Upper Bavaria. She's not able to join us here today live, but she sent us a short statement that I'm going to read in a bit. Charlotte Knobloch uh, never uh, left the country. She always, she has always lived and stayed in Germany, and she's one of the most powerful, powerful voices that advocates for a new life for the Jews in Germany. So now we are going to start with this panel because precisely the community in Munich, different to other community of Jews, is contrary to the Stolpersteiner project. So I'm going to read. Uh, her statement on her behalf and of course I will she would like to greet on her behalf well Charlotte says for many years now on the pave on the pavements in many German cities uh, Stolpersteine are placed the aim of this project is to integrate the memory of the crimes of National Socialism in the day-to-day -day lives in cities and to highlight the geographical continuity. No city in Germany has been excluded from that history and therefore the responsibility to remember concerns all municipalities in equal parts. Where injustice has been done against the Jewish people, these need to be remembered. However, in my opinion, the Stolpersteiner are not the best mean to do that because of their aesthetics and functionality. First of all, placing commemorative stones or in the pavement is at the very least unfortunate because it doesn't respect the victims. And the scenario doesn't allow for a proper commemoration. Think of the weed growing in between the stones, the dog droppings, I melted ice creams and uh, flip flops uh, of passers by. I think it's impossible for anyone to stop uh, before them. And I think it's not realistic to pay a proper tribute. Secondly, to engrave these stones with the names and the dates of the victims of the Holocaust uh, awakes negative associations. And since these Stolpersteiner resemble very much tombstones, their installation on the ground should be prohibited because you are, we are actually stepping on the memory of the deceased. And finally, the organization of this initiative as a private artistic action is quite problematic. The uh, power of decision and the sovereignty of interpretation of this commemoration lie in hands of very few who under the artistic freedom, if needed, escape from the institutional control regarding established commemorations uh, that have been approved in a democratic manner. As a consequence, for example, some Stolpersteiner have been placed with national socialist expressions without any context. And I think this is a very important problem. In many, many cities, Stolpersteiner have placed uh, have been placed. And this puts a lot of pressure to other municipalities to do the same. As an alternative, I uh, 
we would welcome a way of commemorating people that are at the eye level of the passerby to put a plaque or a star on buildings where Jews used to live before 1945 is a more dignified solution. And I'm happy that since uh, summer 2018, more and more memory signs are being placed in my home city, Munich. However, the decision must be taken at the end of the day by each and every municipality. And it would be, I would be very happy to see Munich's example to be followed by other uh, cities. So these would be uh, the, wor the words of Charlotte. And now we are going to give the floor to Anna Wader, and we're going to start um, with this presentation. Anna, she's a PhD student at the University of Potsdam. She coordinates the artistic movement of Stolpersteiner. E She's a member of the Council Stiftung Spüren. And in her 10 minute presentation, she will talk about the European project on micro monuments. So now we are going to uh, give the floor to Anna. Uh, we are very happy to have you among us. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very much. Can I share my screen? So, uh, a very good afternoon to you all. Thank you, um, Catherine, for your kind words. Also, thank you for presenting um, the words of uh, Charlotte Knobloch. I would really like to clear up some of the points she made, but this is maybe something for later on in the discussion. And um, yeah, thank you for the Council's Office for Memory for having me here today and having this um, conference. I think it's very uh, important and I'm very happy that the city is open to listening to us and listening to everyone who is engaged in the conference today. Um, I will try to give you a short overview of our, our project today. I will speak about the idea and the concept behind. I will speak about how we perform the Stolpersteine more or less and also which obstacles or challenges we have to face right now. And then shortly I will finish by explaining our newest project which is called Remembrance Stones. So let me start um, by mentioning again that there is actually only one man behind this artwork and he was the one who had the idea to develop such a project and, and who is still up to today traveling around Europe and placing almost every Serpastein by himself. He does this almost 300 days a year and he's placing around 500 stones per month. His name is Gunther Demnek, and I actually work with him very closely since already um, 11 years. Stolpersteine are small cobblestone sized memorials and they are for individual victims of Nazism. There's always one stone per victim. And I really hope that today I can show you that on one hand, we are speaking about one man and small stones or micro monuments, how you call them. But then on the other hand, we're also speaking about the biggest decentralized monument in the world. And we're also speaking about thousands and thousands of volunteers who are involved in this project. Up to today, we have more than 82,000 stones laid in 26 countries of Europe. The idea is that Stolpersteine can be placed in every country or region where the Nazis persecuted their victims between 1933 and 45. They are placed for those who were killed and those who survived. They are also placed for those who had to flee or for those who committed suicide to escape the persecution. So Schopenhauer are laid for Jewish people, Sinti and Roma, LGBTs, Jehovah's Witnesses, people of color, and so on. Basically, anybody who suffered under the Nazi regime. 
Stolpersteine are usually engraved with the heading here lived, then follows the name and the destiny or saying the steps of persecution. Local groups are actually responsible for researching the names and the facts correctly, but before engraving them, we make sure that the information is correct. The stone is placed in front of the victim's last home of choice, often in front of the house in the pavement. In case the building no longer exists, we place it at a distinctive place nearby the original building. So in that way, Stolpersteine make the commemoration of the Holocaust omnipresent but unobtrusive at the same time. They can be easily overlooked by passers-by and do not dominate the streetscape. But for those who spot them, they are an invitation to pause and to contemplate the information. The effect is a sudden interruption in your day-to-day -day life and it's unpredictable. In that way, Stolpersteine are returning the names to our cities, to our streets. The Nazis aim, and this is very important because the Nazis aim was to destroy the victims and the memory that they ever existed. Stolpersteine show persecution and murder, the fate of a singular person gets concrete, it touches us. Also abstract knowledge about history and the Holocaust suddenly becomes tangible. At the same time, the stones provide space to remember the victims and grief. This is, of course, very important for family members because they have no other place to go to remember their family um, members. They have no grave, right? Stolpersteine also show where the victims lived, meaning they lived all over Europe, all over Germany. Misinformation often is corrected. This is very important if you're working on the field of remembrance because truth seeking and acknowledgement of the crimes is very, very important for healing, right? And also for building a democracy. Stolpersteine are about remembering and reflecting. Stolpersteine are not honoring. This way, we change our perspective. The remembrance is not limited to concentration camps or to public monuments, but to the places where the Nazis crimes began. In this way, history gets connected to the present. The civilization is confronted with the cruelties of the past. Especially young people get knowledge about the Nazi past and learn about ongoing consequences. Hopefully they becoming sensitive to similar, to indicators of similar developments in society or state. In that way, we create a link to democracy and human rights. Also, Stolpersteine show that commemoration is a public desire and not a state or official order. There are thousands of volunteers all over Europe who are involved in our project and without them, the Stolpersteine won't be possible. They are the ones who are opening a public platform for debate. As I already said, with a very few exceptions, Gunther Demick lays every Stolperstein by himself. There are no mass light layings. He wants to place the Stolpersteine with dignity. And he also wants that the project is a long-term project. He wants to reach as many generations as possible. Every stone is handmade by our sculpture, Michael Friedrichs Friedländer. In that way, we want to prevent the making and the laying of Stolpersteine from turning into a mass production exercise in contrast to the mass murder of the Nazis. Also very important to mention, one stone actually costs 132 euros. Um, and this is normally financed by private sponsors. And since 2015, Stolpersteine are officially a non-profit foundation. Many people, especially in the academic world, call Stolpersteine a grassroots movement because this um, local groups grow like grassroots um, all over Europe. Um, also, it is called a counter monument because in opposite or in contrast to the big 
state monuments, they are small and they come from civil society. I'm pretty sure my colleagues will speak about that further. Um, Gunther Demnig himself calls the Stolpersteine a social sculpture, meaning that Stolpersteine are affecting society and are also an inspiration for other projects. Now I wanna speak about our, let's call them obstacles or challenges. First of all, and also regarding to Charlotte Knobloch, there are always and many arguments against Stolpersteine. And from our point of view, that is totally fine. Some may be more valid than others, and I'm pretty sure we will discuss some of them later on. Our point of view always is, you don't always have to agree with us, and it is very, very important to have a discussion. Our project is still learning, deve um, developing, and growing and changing almost every year and every day. And also, we feel that discussion and debates are kind of the basis of a democratic society. But actually, what we are facing right now go goes way further. You know this, and I know this, and we are feeling this right now, is there is an increasing problem with neo-Nazism, far-right extremism, and neo-right populism. There are groups and organizations who are publicly against Stolpersteine, and they are the ones who spread rumor, rumors about us. They're attacking us, especially on social media. There's a lot of harassment that Gunther Demnig has to suffer, and also the local groups and relatives. So far, we have around 800 damaged stones and 400 stones have been stolen. To close, I will now introduce to you one of our newest projects. Uh, we started this pilot project in 2018. Um, I have to explain that we often get asked if you can't place Stolperschein also for other victims or for other um, history time frames um, or other um, yeah, victims of fascism or, or so on. Um, and we made in Spain uh, in that year the first uh, abstraction um, and developed this new project and um, placed um, stones for person who, persons who were tortured or murdered by supporters of Franco. This project is kind of connected to the Stolpersteine because it is the same time frame. And the underlying idea was that Franco would not have won without the support of Nazi Germany. These stones look almost exactly the same as Stolpersteine, but they are made out of stainless steel instead of brass. So they look more silver and Stolpersteine look more gold, right? So I will close now and I'm hoping in the 10 minutes. Um, I will finish and just um, quote a student um, who was asked if you would, if he's not afraid of Stolpersteine because you could stumble up on them. And he said, no, no, you don't fall. You stumble with your head and with your heart. And this kind of like wraps up the whole idea of Stolpersteine, I feel. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Anna. Gracias, muchas gracias. Por Anna, esta... Thank you so much, Anna, for this first intervention in our panel called Genesis of a Project, Micro Monuments of Solberstein uh, in Beginning Repercussion, uh, International Repercussion and Debate. So let's move directly to the idea of having three brief presentations and then move on to the debate. We'll move on to the next lecture is Stella Schindel, who is a doctor in sociology, academic coordinator of the Adrenia Institute for European Studies, uh, the Cultural Studies School in the European University of Adrenia in Frankfurt, Oda, in Germany. And she will tell us about a, uh, she'll give us a micro lecture, stumbling on memory, the memories between the local and the global. You have the floor. Hola, muchas gracias. Uh, voy a Hi, thank you very much. I'm also going to share my presentation. Solo un momento. Give me one moment, please. 
No se ve, ¿verdad? Todavía no. Ahora sí. Ahora sí. Muy bien. Bueno, muchas gracias. Uh, well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be able to share here with you some ideas obtained in different dialogue and exchange projects between Latin America and Germany concerning memory and remembrance and globalized uh, memory, uh, multi-directional. It's been called in several ways in the past decade. Some authors speak of a globalization of the language, memorial language of the Holocaust, how it spread. And it's also been a productive uh, appreciation of these memory practices in Latin America and in Spain. So what I want to highlight today is basically how these experiences in memorial uh, experiences have the brand of the context they derive from. So I think it's important to think of the specific context they derive from. The initiatives we discussed today and the Stolperstein that we are discussing today. In the 90s in Germany, when the Stolperstein appeared, there was a discussion on the creation of a great monument to the Jews murdered in Europe. Discussed for many years at some time, some said that the debate itself was perhaps the best possible monument, a way to keep the memory alive with this lively discussion, whether it turned out into the actual monument in stone. But the purpose of building and centralized a huge monument in Germany, which led to a set of monuments later on in the center of Berlin had to do with a specific moment in Germany after the reunification. When Berlin was the capital again, there was the political need to inscribe the memory in a visible and profound way in the new capital. So the state built a great monument or a set of monuments in the political and administrative center of the country. Back then we considered essential uh, ideas like the dimension of the monument, the size, whether it should and could be in proportion with the size of the murder of the genocide deserved a huge monument asking about the relationship of the memorial with the authentic memory places, the concentration camps, why build a special in why build it in a, in a special place when there were other places where these things happen? Who should build a monument for who? Who is it addressed at? And how to avoid the official memorial to become a place for protocols and not the live collective memory? How to avoid vandalization as a as object for tourism, how to prevent it to be a theme park for memory, the thematization of memory, a place that we go to remember to, but it doesn't, it is not still integrated in our uh, daily memory. So in that context, the anti-monument movement appeared in Germany to think of these non-conventional ways of um, remembering in the city works, questioning the traditional idea of a monument as something fixed and definite uh, with uh, rather pointing at the silence, uh, generating questions, uh, generating reflection and different ways of appealing. And in this context, there was a proliferation of decentralized memories like the Stolperstein. These are just some examples in Berlin of intervention, dispersing memory, incorporating them in daily places, integrating them in the whole of the city, in the geographics of the city, in where the uh, pedestrians walk. So the Stolperstein should be seen as part of this attempt to correct or complement the official memories with a set of micro memories, anti-monuments, anti-central initiatives, etc. But this corresponded to a specific moment 
and state of memory in Germany where the fear was that the weight of official narratives would be away from the general uh, feeling of the population, but the official uh, memory could also be important as a recognition of the crime. In Argentina, where the state for a long time was not responsible for, uh, did not take responsibility for the disappearance, the fact that this should change was a demand of the organizations of relatives because that was a official recognition, meaning that the initiatives of memory bring the brands of the society and the historic moment they come from, and they respond to collective, specific collective needs. They are the product and expression of a state of debate and the relation with the past. And let me highlight this from an example in Argentina, the so-called tiles for memory. They were done in 2005, an initiative called Barrios por la Memoria y Justicia with uh, tiles of places where the uh, victims of state terrorists lived, studied, etc. The initiative was done by a group of uh, neighbors with an interterritorial inter base action. The result, it has a familiar relationship with the Stolperstein. It needs to involve the presence of the neighborhoods, combining public and private, the places where they were taken. Well, in this case, the tiles are produced color in a color collective manner. Uh, institute or activists and neighbors take part in the manual confection of production of these tiles. And also variations and alterations are admitted. This contrasts with the uh, way of work of Denmark, which is highly centralized. I do not mean that one practice is better than the other. I just mean that they reflect different dynamics. The Argentinian memory is based on activism and advocacy with a strong tradition of uh, activism. The collaboration between activists and institutions has been translated in a language and a culture uh, that is very particular. For example, the mothers of the disappeared or the sons and daughters of the disappeared. And uh, also the, hand, the white handkerchiefs of these mothers who were engraved on the floor uh, were, were represented the uh, degree of the mobilization. Then these project with these silhouettes at human scale throughout the city. It aims at representing the essence of the disappeared. Then we have numerous experiences of signaling, uh, which sometimes clandestine in the neighborhoods, uh, also signaling or marking uh, places where people were repressed or where the aggressors used to live. Then signs. Uh, marks, posters, all these elements signal or are the result of these demonstrations and are left uh, there. So the signaling of the space is not done afterwards. It is rather the result of the civil mobilization. And I, I wanted to highlight where the point where globalized language and local memories uh, come together. In 2005, uh, just a few months before this initiative was launched, some Argentinian activists had, had taken place into a dialogue program in Berlin, where some of the initiatives I mentioned were discussed. So these examples uh, inspired the tiles. But, this influence was mixed with this mobilization tradition uh, for memories that already existed. So the tiles can be linked to the existence of international networks of uh, members of the academia and activists and the local tradition. And uh, they were signaling that uh, I'm actually running over my 10, uh, 10 minutes. And what I wanted to 
highlight with my presentation is that there are no standard, no universal models, and there are no franchises, no franchising when it comes to memories. In this case, there were no instructions, there were no checklists. It was just a creative manner to uh, shape the initiative. And I'm not saying this is the format that should be followed, but it should be in any, in any uh, context, the result of the production of the society. Thank you very much, Estela. Thank you very much for that. for your contribution that uh, has brought us to uh, a very far away place in the world. And we are going to move on now to our next panelist. I got some papers here. I'm going to give the floor to Peter Carrier. Peter is joining us from Germany. He's a doctor in philosophy. Yes, we can hear you. Wonderful. Hello, thank you. He's a historian. Sorry. He's a researcher at the Georg Eckert Institute in Rundsbeck, and he's an editor at the Journal of Educational Media, Memory and Society. His presentation is called Resisting Appropriation, Stumbling Stones Between Politics and Ethics. So, He's going to talk about these tensions between the politics and the ethics, which is the starting point, point of his micro uh, presentation. You have now the floor. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Catherine. I, well, can you hear me clearly? Yes, very clearly. I would like to propose a way of reading stumbling stones in terms of what we may call semiotic systems in which groups of people find meeting, meaning, groups which we could call miniature ephemeral societies or institutions. Uh, traditionally, at least since the 19th century, monuments have been commissioned by states to provide symbols of nationally significant historical events, such as wartime exploits for or to be consumed by national groups of people. Now, however, Stumbling stones, like other micro monuments, turn this tradition on its head. They are commissioned not by states, or, but by citizens and provide symbols of local events, even though these are part of national and international events. Moreover, their small size means that they can be read and consumed only by individuals and, for, and small groups who approach them and there is no space around them on the pavement for large state gatherings. But if, if stumbling stones are not made by states or for nations, who are they made for and what makes them potentially resist politicization? I'd like to address these two questions separately. Uh, first, uh, what political groups do the stones bring into being? Uh, to my knowledge, uh, the highest political authority involved in stumbling stones in Germany has been a small group of parliamentarians. On the 9th of June 2015, 10 members of parliament acted as commissioners of 10 stones laid in front of a parliamentary building in Berlin. The uh, president of the German parliament, Norbert Lemmert, and members of all party fractions attended the installation ceremony. But this was an exception. As a rule, there is no regular national state involvement in this monument. More common is municipal involvement, municipal governments by means of the city cultural fund in Berlin, for example, uh, funded an itinerant exhibition about stumbling stones in 2019 and municipal councillors uh, not only have to approve the laying of stones but also regularly attend the installation ceremonies in Braunschweig and Oranienburg for example and they also hold speeches there but of course uh, most work is done by members of civil associations as we know 
local initiatives, local residents, school teachers and their pupils or relatives of deportees collect information, apply for the stone to be approved, find funding, organize and attend the ceremonies and subsequently clean the stones. In short, I think we can conclude that such stumbling stones embody a new type of civil monumentalization beyond national traditions. Um, but despite this, I think that this micro monument is even more radical, uh, which is why I would like to pose a second question, which is how do the stones resist politicization? Um, first of all, I think they do this by naming names. Um, what I find most surprising when we read the information on stumbling stones is the reasoning they contain or rather not contain. Um, we read on the stones names, but not names of national or ethnic subjects. Uh, there is rarely a mention of a political category ascribed to subjects by their persecutors, whether Jewish, German, resistant, Slav, or asocial. Uh, and so there is therefore no reason or e ideological justification given on the stones for the deportation. In other words, uh, the stones invite those of us who read them to enter into a relationship with the name, but not with politically enforced categories used to define group affiliation between 1933 and 1945. Categories which are uh, still, I believe, active in our minds today. In this way, I think stumbling stones challenge politicization by commemorating a person or even personhood, and especially they commemorate the moment at which that person was forced to lose his or her home. In other words, we could say that they resist categories in our minds which were passed down to us by national socialism. Another way um, in which stumbling stones resist politicization, I think, is their use of space by formal qualities inherent in the monument itself and the communication process they incite. Um, their broad spatial distribution in urban space, um, as Anna uh, explained earlier, uh, does not lend itself to linear narratives fondly used by walking tours for tourists in the center of capital cities such as Berlin. Um, for stumbling stones, rather occupy decentral sites and are contingent on the sites of former homes of deportees and on the will of other people to commission stones for them. So stumbling stones also have the potential to surprise passers-by by catching their attention as they walk past them and thus by interrupting daily life. Their large numbers also make them banal and thereby prevent us from associating them with the same type of aura um, or sort of uh, spiritual values normally projected onto national memorials located in the center of capital cities. And as mentioned, their location in what are often narrow pavements does not lend itself to large social gatherings necessary for national inauguration ceremonies. Um, finally, uh, resistance to politicization is provided by the small size of groups involved in the creation of each stone uh, for micro monuments in a way generate moral, moral communities which are too small to be called political institutions. These communities cause momentary encounters in a subnational or international micro society consisting of commissioners, the artist, passers by, teachers, and pupils and people attending ceremonies or just learning about the biographies of deportees. 
Um, so uh, to conclude, I uh, suspect that stumbling stones are not intrinsically political and that if they find themselves at the center of public controversy, this is generally a result of the projection of political convictions onto them, or even because we might literally be misreading them as they function as signs and as traces, a function which consists in essence in these three factors I mentioned, in their focus on names rather than categories, uh, on the contingent non-linear uh, spaces they generate, and the small ephemeral moral groups they produce. Um, I'd like to leave it at that, I think within the time, and I look forward to uh, questions or the discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much, Peter. Muchas gracias. Realmente estupendamente mantenidos todos. Well, I have to say that our panelists uh, have manage very well the allocated time. So we have now some uh, minutes for uh, Q&A and we do have our first question already. Jose Rodriguez. Uh, he has a question for Charlotte Knobloch. He rather comments on what he on what she uh, says. If uh, this uh, memorials and monuments were to be placed on the walls, uh, well, this would be impossible in many cases because the neighbors of the building would oppose to their installation. And well, it would be wonderful for Catherine, Catherine to be here and uh, to get to know from her experience if this happens in Munich. Knowing that this is not uh, usually what happens. Well, it's rather a comment, not a question, and it's quite interesting after all the topics and ideas that have been thrown to the discussion. The Stolperstein as a monument that arises from society, from civil society, and that is the anti-response to the official commemoration. Maybe anyone or any of the speakers wants to uh, say something or maybe you want to engage in a discussion among you. We want to open the floor now for uh, some debate. Well, maybe I start and I, I just start and then maybe we can go on from that. Um, I, 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 maybe I will make two um, small comments uh, regarding this, like placing them on the wall. Um, um, against like placing them on the ground. Um, maybe it is interesting to know that actually Gunter Demnick had first the idea to place them on the walls, like on the houses, but then he came to the conclusion that, that this would make his, his project so much more difficult because then the decision to place these um, blocks or plagues will be in private hands because the wall of a house belongs to a private person right and the pavement normally belongs to the city so it's public space and he only needs the city's permission to place a stone instead of um, each house owner owner so he changed his mind he started to place them on the ground and actually also it's very important to know in that process that was 25 years ago um, he was in um, very he worked very close together with some um, Roma um, associations in Germany and also with Jewish associations because also not as um, Charlotte Knobloch painted it he is not like very close-minded and makes every decision on his himself he's always like in discussion with a lot of people and experts and so on like how to develop his project and so at that time he had this discussion and actually a lot of people told him no it, it's kind of okay to place them on the ground because a lot of graves are also on the ground and they are not even graves there are um, remembering plagues and um, so he came to the conclusion also to use the material brass because the original idea actually was that people would step on them and then with their shoes polish the brass so that it will be shiny. 
in reality, it is not, <laughs> it doesn't work like it because most of the people, as we noticed, don't step on them. And so they don't get polished by shoes. And now this is a development we see more or less since maybe five years. There are a lot of groups all over Europe who go um, on a regular base outside and clean the stones. Um, you know, and so this is uh, maybe the background information why they are on the ground instead of on, on the walls. Joanne, um, maybe Estella and Peter want to add something to that? Can you hear me? I would like to ask or reflect on why the fear to politize a memory and why should a monument depolitize a memory it's one of the questions of of this session right how to depolitize uh, remembrance i wonder if remembrance and memory could not be polit political if it's as uh, Catherine said in the introduction if it's the product of the conflict and encounters and tension between different versions and narratives of the past. If what we want is to create uh, conflicts of narratives of the past, then is it, it's the political sense in the strong terms uh, sense of the term. Another thing is the the parties, the use of the parties of uh, instrumentalizing and using this memory and remembrance. But I think a memory and remembrance is necessarily political. Anna was, spoke of uh, the right wing attacks to the to the stones. Should we let them have the political initiative, or should we have a remembrance policy? Um, is it and um, is it not really necessarily political after all it's a question and a reflection at the same time i believe we have more questions here one refers to to argentina are the memorial uh, initiatives in Argentina completely decentralized? Was it grassroots organizations and neighbors organizations that initiated these in the neighborhoods where we find them? And another question has to do with the documents of the uh, aggressions to the stones Anna mentioned. Have you reflected on the matter or the uh, attack of these public monuments exposed? Or perhaps Peter would like to add something on the politization or depolitization of the role of politics in public commemoration. Uh, yes, I, I would like to um, briefly mm. add something to what Estela said. Um, I think um, it is healthy to engage in the politicization and discussion about the politics of memory, um, but public discussion has become polarized in with group categories, I believe. Um, and the uh, if we try to read the intrinsic message of the stones, they themselves do not send out political messages um, to debate with, but I think reduce the, the communication to a smaller tangible group um, between individuals in small groups and they sort of they moralize uh, the communication in a way and make it more accessible more learnable on a lower level but also enable um, let's say groups of people who come as people not as members of groups <laughs> defending interests um, and i think those are two separate things and you need to distinguish at what levels public debate is taking place on, on national levels or on local levels and individual levels. And they're all legitimate in their own way, I think. Mm 
si quisiera solo yes, I just want to responder a la pregunta answer sobre, um, the question um, on the initiatives in Argentina. I think there have been neighborhood organizations, but many times the national government or the municipal government um, have cooperated or not. Um, it's been uh, getting together as there are different elements memorial elements that get together in different places. Um, speaking of the Baldosos de Memoria, I would really like to give um, the information out there that there are actually a lot of projects worldwide who got inspired by Stolpersteine. Um, and we work very closely with a lot of them. For example, there's the last address, which is I'm remembering the victim of Stalinism. Then there is the Baldosos de Memoria and also a new project um, rising in Chile, which is called Residencias de Memoria for the victims of the dictatorship there. And then we have three projects in, um, in the US where they are um, very similar to Stolpersteine stones, which are remembering um, victims of slavery. Um, but um, to be very clear, we work with them together and we um, support every project and every association who is um, doing these remembrance and projects and, um, and also the idea of Gunther Demick was actually to inspire our other projects. But also there are in Europe some copies of Stolpersteine and some of them <laughs> even call them Stolpersteine or stumbling blocks or whatever. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is a big problem for us because people think it is us, but it is not us and it's not the same quality which we can kind of guarantee right and also it's a problem because Stolpersteine are an artwork and you shouldn't copy an artwork I think I don't have to go further into that so um, just to to give an idea that there is um, yeah, yeah that it has to 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 keep in mind that Stolpersteine are artwork and they shouldn't be copied because um, we had these cases in France for example and I always um, like to give this uh, information out there. And um, yeah, regarding the documentation of, of aggressions against Stolpersteine, of course, we have an internal uh, documentation about that. We also work very closely with, um, with the police um, here in Germany and in Europe. Um, sadly, up to today, there's only one case who has been solved so far. So there was a neo-Nazi who destroyed Stolperstein in Austria, actually, and he was found guilty. Um, we don't um, really, um, our reaction normally is to get our lawyer involved and to work with the police, but we don't make it publicly. We don't like spread it over social media or Twitter because we don't want to give the aggressors even more attention to what they are doing. So our way to handle these things is like we are legal path and not in the public. Very interesting. Okay, we have more questions from the audience, as I can read. One has to do with the uh, Charlotte Nobloch as a survivor. Javier asks, he says it's important to take into account that what she considers a a commemoration, an academic, non-academic, nor rational position, but rather a direct and personal position. So how to confront this with the arguments of the experts that articulate rationally their ideas to justify a project or a point of view? This is one of the questions of this, the basic principle of hearing the voice of a survivor of the Holocaust. Regarding to that, um, maybe first of all, it is important to mention, of course, there's one artist and we are a small team working for the Stolpersteine, but we are not like close team. We are um, very much involved in a lot of discussion about memory. We work actually very closely with a lot of associations for survivors and family members. A lot of family members request the Stolpersteine. Um, and so... It is not that there's one artist who's going around, a German artist even, placing these Stolpersteine. 
we are not forcing anyone to, sh to play Stoppersteine as a family. Sometimes this happens like some students more and more, more get involved. The students are researching a Stolperstein, wants, want to place them. We are contacting the family, asking them if they want to come or um, participate in the laying and they're saying, no, it's not our thing. We're not forcing them. Like we just don't place the Stolperstein. And we had even the situation that someone wanted to place a Stolperstein. And in the moment we were there, he was like the niece of a of a um, of a survivor, and he was like, "No, actually, I feel that is too emotional. I can't do it." And we stopped. We stopped the ceremony, and that's it. And um, now the stones actually placed because he changed his mind a, a few years later. But um, so I respect Charlotte Knobloch's um, experience very much, and her point of view is very important, of course. Like, who am I to say some, something against that? But there are so many other people, survivors and family members, relatives who want them. And of course, we want to work with them. And um, yeah, I think this is really what I said before, like there has to be a discussion. We have to be open. And if one day it happens and no one wants to place a Stolperstein, probably this project will like end. And that is OK, I feel. But up to today, like there are still so many people who want them and until like, yeah, we get requests, of course, we will continue our work. I would like to say a word. Um, it's uh, paradoxical that uh, Charlotte Knobloch says that uh, the stones escape institutional control. That's the quotation from Catherine earlier, escape institutional control, uh, but they don't escape her control <laughs> over the municipal council in Munich, which is uh, quite strange. I wonder how many people in Munich have tried um, to uh, work with stones and failed. Um, uh, perhaps uh, Anna knows a thing or two about that. Yeah, the situation in Munich is very interesting and I would say very complicated. Maybe it's too much for just to wrap it up now in a few sentences, but yeah, it's true. Like we have made 400 stones and they are already um, produced and they are waiting in Munich to be laid. And now we have to place them in private space. This is a big exception. Normally we always place them in public space, but the city council of Munich doesn't give us the permission to lay these stones, even though there are many, many family members, even survivors, not only Jewish people, also from all other groups of victims who want to place them. And we don't get the permission because, and that is as what Peter, I think, is referring to. Charlotte Knobloch has a very um, close connection, maybe, to the city's municipalities. And um, so, yeah, and the, she also created this like different form of remembrance there, which is like, um, I don't know the expression in, in English, but these are more or less like um, high blocks and they have also a plaque on it. They are very, very similar to Stöpersteine, almost looking the same. And she created this project and this is now supported by the city's council. But this is like, I, I think like one of these um, remembrance and plaques costs around like a thousand to two thousand um, euros and it is um, organized by the municipality of Munich. So it's very different to our project. Um, so yeah, maybe I close with that. Like there are still so many other dimensions to that, but yeah, Munich is a topic on its own. <laughs> Well, we have tenemos algunos puntos más, pero I believe we have some more comments, uh, but we really should be breaking. There are some comments saying that the Stolpersteine do have an important political uh, load. They are powerful weapons against fascism, and they have the potential to educate and generate awareness in society. And the fact that uh, high school students use, use them as reference, they visit, they study the uh, bibliography, um, it's a set of comments that we have received. Uh, they learn about the life of the deported. It's a direct way of learning the history of these people, is what the uh, messages we got say. And I don't know if Estela wants to make a comment to finish this block. Yes. Yes, yes. I want to thank the organizers for the invitation and I want to say goodbye, greeting the huge uh, tradition of resistance 
and Remembrance in Catalonia were speaking of a history of anti-Franco uh, regime. And I'm sure there are many practices and modes of remembrance. And I'm sure that Barcelona has many of them, not just traditions as an existentialist way, but also the collective and popular uh, knowledge uh, built in through years and years. So paying tribute to the resistance, it was really an honor to be here in this meeting. I think these are perfect words with which to close this first table. I want to thank you, Estela, Peter, and Anna for your presence and participation. I hope you can continue connected this afternoon. And so that's it for the first part. We will take a 20 minute break because our technical staff needs this period of time. We will come back at 5.05 .05 with the next panel. Thank you so much for your interventions and insights, so very important. expectativas de las asociaciones de afectados, la voluntad de actuar y la apropiación política. Tenemos eh, seis ponentes. We're going to talk now about the expectation of the associations and we have six panelists. Jordi Rabasa is here with uh, me and the other five are online. This is going to be a very intense panel uh, devoted to the city of Barcelona. Jordi Fontagullo is going to be our first speaker. He's a historian, a cultural manager and former director of the Cultural Museum to the Exile and currently a director of the Memorial, uh, Democratic Memorial of Catalonia. Can you hear me well, please? Well, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for having me here today on this discussion around the Stolpersteiner. And my micro intervention is going to be very brief. We have little time, so I'm going to start right away. As you already know, in 2015, uh, the Navas municipality was the first location in Catalonia where the first Tolpersteiner were located. And it happened as it happens elsewhere. Uh, there were some research carried out by uh, researchers from the area. And then the municipality was requested uh, for the installation of the Stolpersteiner. Afterwards, in 2017, the Democratic Memorial, which is an institution uh, linked to the Catalan government and that uh, combines representatives from different institutions of the uh, Catalan parliament and whose main goal is to deploy public memory policy, among them deportation. Well, uh, well this institution approved this um, request from civil society. Then more municipalities um, joined this initiative. And as I said, most of the requests uh, came from the municipalities and civil society organizations. People, organizations uh, addressed their city councils and representatives, local um, representatives in order to carry out the implementation of this Tolpersteiner. And then the Democratic Memorial Institution uh, channels all these requests. And this is a flagship institution of the policy or the memorial policies of the country. And we also uh, count the number of Tolpersteiner installed up today, until today. And by the questions, included in the program of today's conference, we could say that this institutional gesture coming from civil society could have negative uh, connotations, as if the project would lose its uh, significance, its, its relevance when in touch with the institutions. This could be seen as something negative, but I myself differ from that opinion, because this is a public initiative and if institutions are public and work, as we all hope, uh, 
well, this do not happen. Well, that's not the case. Many people in society believe that these initiatives, as it happens in education, must be public. We should ask ourselves how many museums or cultural centers would be able to survive without institutional support. So these policies are indeed necessary. Another question launched by our panelists is how can we depoliticize um, these installations? Is that really feasible? Should, are we mixing uh, politics and culture? Maybe we should avoid politicization, but at the end of the day, public policies, these are public policies for commemoration and remembrance. Why did we adopt the project Stolperstein at our institution? Well, basically because our institution, which is based on diversity, gathers the requests in Catalonia in favor of the artistic project carried out by Gunther Denmik. This is a trend that's very, that has been very notorious, especially over the last 30 years. This is public art, but public art is not only the art publicly displayed and not all the art in the public space can be considered as such. So these initiatives have uh, very close links to memories and also the recuperation and restoration of the memories of, these de of the deported people. So this work in process carried out by Gunther Denmik responds to this uh, goal. De deported in Catalonia or those victims of the Nazi persecution are sometimes caught in oblivion and this negative memory must be uh, opposed and subvert. The performance of Gunther Denmik is quite significant because it includes people from Catalonia and Spain affected by the Nazi violence and they are part of a group of victims and it is easier as such, to highlight the relevance of democracy in Europe, to establish the transnational link among the victims of Nazi Nazis is not nothing banal. And we insist on the idea that if there's something that unites Europeans is the memory of the Holocaust and deportation. When we stop uh, in front of a Stolpersteiner, which is something very silent and discreet displayed in public art, has a pedagogical and artistic uh, potential. All of these makes the project Stolpersteiner as a great way to remember the victims of uh, the Nazi regime in Catalonia. As we said earlier, Stolpersteiner also the anti-monument and it eludes and escapes from this kitsch corporativism and activism. It is a Stolperstein, it is a tile, and it is an artistic project that could be included in some conceptualist uh, art uh, trends. This does matter because the artwork can be found in the context of the second half of the 20th century, is far from amateur. It is the result of cultural and aesthetic uh, trends, and that's why it is so powerful. I think it concentrates in a very compact and small format, both the high culture and the elements of the popular and traditional culture. For popular grief, the handcraft behind its production, also the ritual of installation. All of this is art and popular at the same time. And it resembles, even if indirectly, to um, tombstones and funerals. It could be also political art, public art. Very often, as you see, this kind of art faces many challenges. 
However, in this case, without forgetting aesthetics, the artist has managed to transform his uh, artwork in a great way to convey the pain of the people who suffered from national socialism. And I think it also relates to the modern European society, the progressive Europe, the representation of pain and grief is strictly related to the elements that we saw after the Second World War. For example, Jane Wainter, who's a specialist in the Second World War, in her book on grief and memory on the uh, First World War, he says that after Hiroshima, as the highest degree of violence, we were not able to go back uh, to do a traditional way to represent pain and grief. So Stolpersteiner fulfilled this function. And the combination of these and the emergence of a public art that combines politics and inter, uh, social intervention. Monumental aspects disappear here. And it paves the way for a moment of being together, of togetherness. You do not need to stumble over these st stones. It is a form of preparation, of acknowledgement that follows a thorough research. And it also supports some pedagogical projects, as we see in many places where uh, these stones have been installed. It is an artwork that is ephemeris in time, but it's also solid, it is material, as we see in the tiles. And we could say that the different Stolpersteiner draw a path, a path that you can follow in order to relieve the experiences of those people. And I believe that there's something very interesting in that project. Usually the first trial, it is installed by the artist himself, Gunther Denmik, but he also uh, paves the way for other people to install all the uh, Stolpersteiner. And we said that earlier, and for example, anyone can become an artist. For example, a municipal worker who installs a Stolperstein is an artist during that uh, few moments. It also creates or raises awareness of or in society. And that's why from our association, we support all municipalities in Catalonia that want to ad adhere to this uh, decentralized movement. And to ramp up, I would like to say that the transcendental uh, understanding of uh, existence uh, concentrated in the fact of a passerby Topping, stumbling over one of these stones, it is the main goal of history in capital letters, which is conveying the stories of lost lives. It is a project that has no visible end, and it is a project that uh, endures time as a living memory. And I think that is precisely one of the main advantages of this Tolpersteiner project. Well, I would like to leave it here from my side and I will be available for questions later. Thank you very much, Jordi. Before we move on to our next speaker, I have to say that we, I've been warned by the technicians, uh, by the person who gathers all the questions and comments, we should actually send the questions to the Q&A box and send the comments to the chat because otherwise everything gets mixed up and it is very difficult to gather your comments and your questions separately. Thank you very much, Jordi, for your contribution. It was a very clear thank you. So now we're going to move on to our second speaker, Rosa Toran. She's a She's got a PhD in history, and she's also a speaker at the Amical Mauthausen and the Popular Association. And she's here on behalf of the Association Amical Friends of Mauthausen. And now I'm going to give the floor to Rosa. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. Can you hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you very well. Well, I'm very happy to be here and to be able to share uh, this discussion, which has been very intense so far, and I'm sure it's going to be as intense until the end. Well, I'm here as a representative and on behalf of an association, which is called Amical of Mauthausen, and not only Mauthausen, but an association that represents all the victims of the Nazis. And I would like to start by providing you of a definition of the word or the concept of victim. And I think that my contribution uh, goes a bit beyond uh, from the Solpersteiner project. In Catalonia, until now, these stones have been installed in the memory of the deported. But going back to what, what I was anticipating, the literal uh, description of a victim is those of a person who has been caused injury and injustice. And also people understand as a victim, the deceased. But the concept is much broader than that. And I think that's a concept and if you'll allow me, I'm going to, sh to do some, his some historic uh, reflection. Well, this concept has evolved very much over the years and it's having now a different concept. It's a political thing. The definition of a victim uh, comes from afar. And in many cases, it has had a restrictive military, and um, from a male standpoint, uh, this has been the term based on these three concepts. In the case of France, it's clear the political battles that this generated, the battles between the Gaul supporters and communists in the Cold War. And in the case, in the case of the anti-fascist Republicans in France, this has had very direct consequences, for example, the network Wolfgang, instead of being integrated as a mm, resistant network, it was excluded from all consideration of a victim with all it entails in terms of the pensions as military uh, relatives or another important moment in the concept of victims is the BC. Uh, promoted by the Bundestag in 1956, establishing indemnizations for victims, specifying the notion of deported. A deported person was any person who had been uh, sent to the death camps, whether they be concentration camps or uh, extermination camps. Very important because this excluded from indemnization to those Republicans who had go, gone back to Spain before 1953, which was uh, an appalling injustice. This, um, this law was expanded in 1965 expanding the concept of victim to widows and parents and others. And another uh, extension of the concept after many years of a struggle appeared in 1984, also with considered with the consideration of victims to all the workers of the tort organization which had about 50,000 Republicans. So in coming to uh, more closer times, the law of orphans in France now of 1950, it was addressed at the orphans of the victims whom could also benefit, uh, also including the sons, the, the offspring of Republicans. And then, This was managed by the International Organization of Migrants and the United Nations, which had a double side. The program 
of uh, assets for the victims of Holocaust with uh, funds derived from the money deposited in Swiss banks. And then the German indemnization uh, program for uh, forced labor in which a good part of the funds came from the companies that used slaved labor. It was important, it was important two programs because it included victims that had been marginalized until then, like the case of the gypsies particularly, and the case of homosexuals, which to then had been completely marginalized. So now we get to what we could consider. What do we consider to be victims of Nazism? It wasn't just those killed uh, in the camps with gas or with, by disease. Also victims would be the dead who died in the transportation to the camps in the trains that we know of. The, those who fled, and there were many, and those who survived the camps because for months and years, they suffered physical and psychological torture and some suicides, which also occurred after the freeing of the prisoners. In terms of the Republicans, what could be considered to be a victim was the great group of those who suffer and deportation to Mauthausen, the Blue Triangles, which came from the war, German war prisoners. Another important thing, which is where we would include women, are the groups of uh, resistant prisoners in, by the Nazi occupation also taken to the camps. And here, there are a significant number of Spanish immigrants who lived in France for some years or decades and would also end up being victims of Nazism. And we should not forget either a small group of Jews, Spanish Jews born in Spain, but who were deported from France. If I'm not mistaken, I'm talking about about 30 people here. And we should also include all those who were arrested, tortured, and executed in France. And the famous, or the sad, I remember the massacre in Oradour with, and in one afternoon, over 600 people being murdered. Among these, there were about 20 Spanish refugees so we are talking of direct victims. And then we have all those who were retained in the French concentration camps after the German occupation. And here there were about 10 camps with many Republicans as well. And then also the 50,000 people approximately who were forced uh, labor for the TOD organization uh, dressed at the camps of the Normandy islands in France or in the Atlantic coast. So having said this, of uh, what it means to be a victim of Nazism, well then in the case of the uh, placement of the Stolperstein, with few exceptions, they focused especially on those deported to the Nazi concentration camps. The first step, as Jordi Fon said, Navas is the first municipality. And after this, this is also expanding quite fast, I have to say. Often the first contact of the um, municipalities or the uh, individuals who want to contact us is through Amical, and now there is quite a bit of uh, information available so as to uh, satisfy these requests. Now, the placement 
requires exhaustive research in order to detect possible errors there might be in mis mistakes in the information available it's very easy to know the place of birth but it's not so easy to know the place of residency all the information available is not completely reliable so we must really undertake um, research which is easy if it's a small scope, but it's complicated if we're talking about the city of Barcelona. And the city of Barcelona, as everywhere else, now we consider um, from the city of Barcelona, not just those who live there, but also those who live there. Um, not just the ones born there are from Barcelona, but also those who lived or studied or did other activities there. Now with the 600 deported from Barcelona, the figure, if we add all this mo social economic mobility, we would be including 1,100 people. There are cases in which there is a duplicity of Stolperstein in the place of birth and in the place of residency. In the case of Barcelona, obviously, there are uh, logistic complications. There has to be some research done rigorously. And this is in the hands, it should be done by historians or well prepared people to comply with the uh, personal satisfaction with the necessary rigor. In the case, there's a recent case in Madrid where there were several stones placed and there were many discrepancies even between the relatives regarding the place where the stone had been laid. So here we have to do this and do it well and this requires a bit of imagination more than just laying the stone in the city of berlin eight thousand stones have been laid but the number of victims is enormously higher what can you do in the city of barcelona there are handy solutions in barcelona maybe not all citizens will know There is in Parque de la Ciudadela a place in memory of the victims of Nazism, those deported and who were from Barcelona. One might think of adding to this perhaps a list. I am sorry to interrupt. I apologize that I interrupt, but you have uh, finished your your 10 uh, your 10 uh, minutes available and we do need the rest of the time for debate so i'm out of time no no please finish no i would just say that we have to reflect on being able to combine the requests of relatives the sentimental requests with honoring any kind of victim, which is many more than just those deported. But if you want, we can continue discussing this during the debate. Thank you so much, Rosa, for your comments, which give us more food for thought. And now directly, we will go, as we do with these micro lectures, we will move to Teresa del Hoyo, our next speaker, who is delegate of the International Committee of Ravensbrück, a member of the executive board of Amical in Ravensbrück. So welcome, Teresa. You have the floor. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, very well. I would like to thank the uh, municipality and the organizers for inviting us to participate uh, to explain our position. Let me begin by mentioning something to begin with. 
which affects us directly, where it says that in 2018, uh, Memorial Democratic promoted the placement of the first stones, one for the survivor of Ravensbrück, Neos Catala, who was alive back then in El Guillamets. The truth is not so. Neos Catala and Mercedes Núñez, her stones were not placed because of Memorial Democratic. In April 2016, the new director of the Mem Democratic Memorial calls the remembrance uh, associations and we had a meeting with with them at the same time we asked for a meeting with the commissioner for memory in the city hall of barcelona in the meeting with memorial democratic we started seeing how complex it was to place the Stolperstein. As we know, we know the process. It's a long list to prepare the stones. This artist has a very busy agenda. So all this led us to offer, to take over the coordination of the project. And we accepted that we started working. And in 2007, we contacted the city halls and Ilz Giamets joined the project with so much enthusiasm that in December 2017, January 2018, we had the stones for Neus Catalan and Mercedes Nunez. And in January as well, Neus Catala had a stone placed in her st in her village with her own presence. As you can see in this video, it was a simple tribute, not institutionalized, simple and plain. The mayor of uh, the village took the floor and then briefly the former director for uh, Memoria Democrática spoke, then our, our chairperson, Ana Salles, uh, took the floor as one of the promoters of the placing of the stone. And finally, Margarita Catala thanked everyone on behalf of her mother for this tribute. There was even time for Marina Rosell to come and approach Neus and started singing Le Migran as she had done many times before. You could not hear, but she was singing. It was a very moving moment and it was beautiful. It was simple, not institutionalized at all. Having finished this tribute, we saw it was time to work on the Soberstein for Mercedes Núñez. But then we, in July 2018, we realized that although the City Hall had not answered, we did know that they had approached the artist to coordinate the placement of stones. Uh, for Mercedes and Núñez. So we approached the person in charge of Memoria, the uh, deputy mayor, to convey our disappointment and also because we lost the chance to have Barcelona be the first city in Spain to place a Stolperstein in the memory of a deported woman. Considering our position, our organization, we completely favor it. We think it helps visibilize women who were victims of a mass murder by the Nazi regime with their names and related to where they lived or were born. Spanish women were all 
arrested in France because they were in exile and they were part of the resistance movement. They were persons, not numbers as the Nazis intended. They had a life and a history. It's a way of uh, relating the current citizens of Barcelona with the places of the city where they lived with this histories, creating some empathy with their suffering, helping alleviate the suffering that society has on these stories and the young, particularly Spain, but recently refused the existence, rejected the existence of deportations uh, because of the Nazis. It's a way to make uh, the deported women of our country historically forgotten and make them equivalent to other deported women from other European countries. As Nos Catala said, the Spaniards, Spanish women were the forgotten of the forgotten. The mar marquis was a marquis. The student went back to university and we went back to serve and clean. And they deserve a posthumous tribute. In the literature of this meeting, it says, in Barcelona should place the 612 stones corresponding to the number of deported persons. We think that the Stolperstein presents a human dimension of the past, usually forgotten by new generations and the official generation uh, representations of the history anonymous. Firstly, with the Franco regime denying their existence and then the Nazi regime dehumanizing them. The women of Ravensbrück, uh, represented in the park of Cervantes, is quite anonymous. The stones spread in the city are helping democratize the memory of our city. On the other hand, in a city of the size of Barcelona, we don't think that 612 stones would be a massification or major change. On the contrary, it would give a global dimension that there wasn't just a few deported from Barcelona. It would also help in the neighborhoods without massification because they would be distributed in different places and neighborhoods. It could be a great monument, as we said before. Uh, instead of a large monument, it would be micro monuments. Barcelona with individual monuments from the Franco regime and other persons of unclear pasts are not in, we cannot, these cannot be denied their individual remembrance. Regarding the institutionalization, we said before that these stones always come from individual groups and they are coordinated by Memorial Democratic. The organizations don't help they propose, they say who and where, and in our case, who participates in the laying event. We do have to say that after consulting about the Soperstein placed after uh, the placement of Neus Catala's stone, all the articles uh, say that it was Memorial, Memorial Democratic, the one who had the initiative, although in the article they do mention the organizations that promoted this. Although the press write what they find most appropriate, we think that if the press derived from the memorial would highlight more the participation of organizations, there would not be this appropriation politizing a social matter. Those responsible in memoria in the city and country should give more protagonism to the associations. And I also want to ask for the participation of the relatives of the victims. Concerning the expectations, we only want to integrate and make our deported women equivalent to other women in Europe. We are, do, we are surprised at the lack of uh, support of the city hall to place these stones in memory of the victims of fascism. We don't see the need for Barcelona to highlight from, uh, stand out from other European cities in this sense. And finally, we want to ask the Catalan government and the city hall and the Spanish government, maximum respect for the victims 
without them being used in any sense. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Teresa, also for uh, sticking to the allocated time and uh, for the for your kind word, words on behalf of the Amical of Ravensbrück. And now we move on to our next speaker, who's Jordi Quiche Corominas. He's uh, got a PhD in history. He's a professor at the University of Barcelona. He's the founder and director of the European Observatory on Memories, uh, which is here in Barcelona. In his uh, micro uh, intervention, he's going to talk about setting footsteps. Welcome, Jordi. Unfortunately, we cannot hear you. Oh, my apologies. You can hear me now. OK, yes. Well, thank you very much for having me here today. I will really try and do my best to uh, keep it short because I'm really interested in the uh, debate afterwards. Or maybe the, today's conference is just the first step towards uh, future discussions uh, where experts and other uh, people can take part in. Not so long ago, and uh, according to some scientific research in Berlin and other uh, places in Europe, have analyzed these big anti-monument, which is so rare in the world. I'm not sure whether it has already been said uh, earlier or not. I don't know whether the artist himself was aware of the extent of uh, his work, his artwork. So I'm just going to outline some topics that uh, hopefully will enable and trigger a very fruitful debate. So I will like to take a look at the relations uh, between the Stolpersteiner and Memorial Initiatives. And uh, I know that uh, this initiative actually caught the attention and the eye of many of us, included myself. I, I wrote on that uh, many, many years ago. I uh, was really interested in the concept of decentralized monument. And now it has reached a complex uh, point, actually which uh, might actually jeopardize its very own roots. Jordi Fond already explained that very well and other colleagues as well. I think it, there's some kind of subversion when something allows for commemoration in public space. We are living in a country which presents an explicit lack of reflection and memory in public space. And this lack of uh, political willingness to create memorials and, and to uh, open spaces for reflection, well, when this happens, a single project, that the one that comes from our initiatives, even though I admire it, and it has many advantages, as we mentioned, of course, it raises some bells and alarms. It is true, though, that there are many, many references. And I think there are about two or three examples that we should bear in mind. I want to leave some of them for the discussion afterwards. Well, the first is the opportunity and opportunism, which have become so uh, widespread in our country. And of course, uh, my fellow previous speakers already highlighted that. Well, if there's an issue that is not included in a press conference, well, that's because uh, there's, uh, that something is not working really well. Of course, it is true, and I, I agree here with uh, Jordi Fon, 
when we talk about collective memory, projects become stuck and cannot be fully implemented. We've seen the case of uh, small municipalities where Stolpersteiner could not be installed. But when we installed the, the stone uh, together with other colleague and auntie uh, Franco, uh, Sebastia Piera, well, I've seen that. And when I participated myself with this kind of uh, copycat, and please do not, no, no offense, I mean, no offense by that, but you know, this uh, willingness to place these stones on, you know, on high streets of uh, municipalities and not in other small villages. Well, uh, you see, the people are after uh, protagonism. And also the discussion, as Rosa highlighted, among uh, or between the place of birth or the place of deportation, right? And we are kind of fine tuning this idea. And I think that we agree more now on the fact that this stone should be placed on the uh, location or in front of the building where the people uh, lived uh, last. Um, experts and people like James Young, who actually coined the expression anti-monument. Let me say, considering this, that this opportunism, which is not only political and from the media, but also at the local sphere, should be flagged down. And I'm sure that Rosa is already aware of that. For example, in the location of Manresa or in the area of Solsonese in 2005, we had some uh, events. But when these installations took place, no uh, political representatives were there and none of them actually were uh, in favor of that. So, the large number of stones installed worldwide, which is almost 70,000, makes that the artwork, this piece of art replicates exponentially. What I would like to see is that this necessary and going by hand by hand while doing research uh, together with the relatives and associations of victims of the deported. I would like for all of this to happen in a country that does, does not lack so much in recognition and acknowledgement of the deported. And this should not have an impact on the uh, awareness of those municipalities and local representatives who, you know, want to uh, show off. And I hope that you'll excuse my language here, that they uh, want to somehow take advantage of that in terms of reparation of the victims of uh, dictatorship. I would say that this would be the most uh, conflict, the point of conflict of uh, this topic. As I said in at, at the beginning of my presentation, I support this initiative. Jordi explained it very well. When a piece of art uh, irradiates, can be jeopardized by the artwork itself. For example, this project for the victim of AIDS, AIDS, when the artist, well, the artist himself, the creator said that eight years after, or the, the, the Gunter Denmik actually eight years after 
uh, well, wasn't expecting that. And, you know, at the very beginning, he signaled those places uh, with uh, chalk uh, in the memory of the Sinti and the Roma victims. He was looking for something that would not last forever, but his project became so successful and was so widely replicated that he kind of had to rethink his own project and he was in favor of considering the already installed uh, artwork as, as art. So that's what I wanted to bring to the table. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a certain danger that this conceptual uh, project uh, becomes something different than initially aimed. It is an expression of completely revolutionary and transformative art, and I particularly love it. But I think it should respond to a more hegemonic project. Uh, and of course, uh, I think in that regard, congrats, congrats to the artist. He's been really successful, but also uh, the victims should be recognized and also those who sponsor them, who sponsor the stones. And finally, I'm not sure whether I'm sticking to my time or not. I would like to oppose the concept of quality and quantity. We won't agree on whether names should be included or not. And I think that after today's conference, we should actually sit and talk about uh, the scope of this uh, of the Stolpersteiner, for example, in Barcelona. We're not going to have a thousand uh, ceremonies, right? So this is something that can be discussed, of course. The project arose from very interesting roots when the artist started he didn't have any permission by the municipality or the state or the government so it was quite a uh, alternative art and i think that's the essence that we should be able to preserve and this is precisely what's so difficult to do and for those who work for them with professionalism, with figures, with uh, victims, with those who fight against the Francoism. And I'm not saying that we should deny any of this, right? But we should maybe rethink in which or by which means in terms of publicity and communication this should be um, conveyed. And finally, let me quote one of the major German experts, which is the Peter Baudora. He's the director of the members of Buchenwald camp. And he deals quite a lot with uh, public budgets and public policies concerning memorials. And some years ago, he said that the worst, in his opinion, is to renounce to the self-reflection because that's going against your own roots. And in memorial policies, this self-reflection, the reflection about the self is of utmost importance. And it conveys many histories and many images that very often are positive, but somehow are pub oriented towards a certain degree of publicity. So we should keep an eye on them. We should be vigilant. And that's the idea I wanted to convey uh, in order to conclude my intervention. Thank you very much, Jordi. Uh, you actually uh, mentioned really interesting points that we will be able to discuss in greater de detail uh, during the discussion. We will now move on to our next speaker, which is Marco Damiel. Welcome to you too.
He's uh, got a PhD in history and the history of art. He's a director of the Miro Foundation in Barcelona. He's also a member of the Assessment Council, of uh, an entity, an institution that assesses uh, the City Council of Barcelona in terms of public art. So welcome. Well, good afternoon and thank you very much to all of you for uh, putting together today's conference. Also a big thanks to all the panelists and the participants and the audience for joining us. Today's conference responds to the willingness or the will of um, broadening the discussion on Stolpersteiner in Barcelona and going beyond the small, this small forum. This is a public discussion, considering the complexity of the topic. It is very important to have today's conference, but I think that we're not going to solve all the doubts today. And basing on what Jordi just said, when, an, when a consultant on art public on public art, sorry, uh, starts uh, working on that topic, uh, you know, it jeopardizes the sub art and character of the uh, piece of art. And that's where the controversy lies. Today, we've seen and heard, and if you've seen Stolpersteiner in the past, I think that we can all agree that it's a very dignified memorial for the people who are commemorated. The reality is that it can, it could be considered a victim of its own success and magnitude. So now the question is, how far, in how far, uh, has the or have the Stolpersteiner been institutionalized and how is the institutionalization the next step that implies or that is implied with the expansion of the project for me is not a vulgarization of the project by no means but probably people do not stumble over these stones right in Berlin, for example, the city where my sister and my mom live, and the city where I discovered these stones for the first time, I found them, you know, completely by chance and in the best possible manner. And my sister explained what was it all about. And for me, you know, they were very powerful because they were literally small. These stones were very, very small. At the same time, there's, you know, a big coordination effort behind it. You know, Visit Berlin, which is the tourism uh, agency in Berlin, has a very extensive dedicated page in its website on uh, that. This is not a problem in itself, of course, because if you visit the city, when, well, we, you know, the, the, we want the visitors to remember this complex history, this difficult and ugly past of the city. But why am I here today? Why should I be here today, actually? Especially when we are surrounded by representatives of uh, relative, relatives of the victims. We have historians who specialize on the topic. And this brought me back to one of my first projects as a, his, a art historian, which was about art and power from dictators from the 1930s until 1940s. It was exhibited in London until in 1995, and then it went to Barcelona and Berlin. 
And the main goal was to analyze art in relation in its relation to power. Our main goal was to explore the relationship between uh, avant-garde art and power and to really understand the very complex relationship between them. This is, of course, a very simple manner to put it, right? Art, avant-garde art or individual art has the ability, has a different capacity, an official and monumentalist capacity to represent the official power. Also, it is shown it very high or very big and very different scales, uh, which very often are quite dehumanized. This corresponds to a certain ex extent to a glorification of the power of a regime. It is very difficult to get over this reality and to change the public perception. To me, that's the most complex point. Monuments are powerful. And when we think that a monument is not powerful anymore, and when we forget about the people who actually see those monuments, we start remembering, and only then we start remembering their capacity. Their and we start rethinking of them as a victim or an object of abandonment, of uh, vandalism, of theft. And precisely nowadays, we are going through an historic moment, for example, represented by the Black Lives Matter movement, that remind us of the power of both large and big or small monuments, even if displayed publicly or on the facade of a private building, but, you know, on the street anyway. And I think it's very important that at all times we remember that those monuments that have the ambition to commemorate and to uh, remember and acknowledge some uh, or the specific situation of a person and moments for the politics, well, it never actually gets to commemorate such situation for such a long time. And the generations that come after, we have the, ch the chance to change such monuments, to change the interaction we have with them and to change history as well. To me, and this is where the voices of participants and the relatives uh, come in, the questions of identity representation on the one hand, there's respect and dignity and dialogue, which is very necessary to define and redefine also what it means to represent also political decisions. And these political decisions must enter a dialogue with these things in a more individual way. The Stolpersteine, to me, clearly, have gone from a counter monument from the grassroots upward to where the Stolperstein website uh, they define as the biggest decentralized monument in the world in many um, cases this uh, in the media the term decentralized disappears and it just becomes uh, plainly the largest monument in the world which no one would define as such but clearly there's a matter of of scale in this concept now let me go back to my personal experience in berlin i think it really works there there are not so many but it's never made me feel like it was excessive or vulgar. On the contrary, we have to consider whether it's a matter of 
panelization with 8,000 stones in Berlin, perhaps it's a decreased presence. It disappears again. It diminishes the severity of the problem. You can spend so much time working, walking around Berlin without finding a Stolperstein, meaning that obviously they are not numerically representative of the Holocaust because they're not, they cannot be. The number of victims of National Socialism enters in conflict with this idea of representing individual individuals as, as their identity. We could say that this concept and the development of this project corresponds to a certain orthodox of institutionalizing uh, a uh, type of art that is at the vanguard and creates a, a bureaucracy out of this. And this is something that I see as such. The content of the Stolperstein is quite good. It's personal information of individuals. So it really helps depolitize the project. It really helps in the individual memory and separate these persons from the persecution categories because persecution was not per individual. It was per a criteria, totalitarian, uh, totalitarian uh, criteria. And to me, this is the great advantage of the Stolperstein. I also think that they could also be an educational tool because we have to create memory memories disappear on their own. If we don't do anything about it, memory does not prevail. In the best case scenario, memory will not continue, but it could be recreated between generations or it could be activated through recovery uh, events. So it's always political. It must be political because as Rosa Torrent said, the thing is, who is the victim? Who's marginalized? Who has the privilege of not needing to fight for memory? Because their history is the official history. The tendency is always towards uh, entropy, towards uh, oblivion. We will forget most of the things that happen. And as a society, we will forget practically everything. This means, on the other hand, we have to fight to ensure that the things we want to remember are remembered. We must remember and discuss on the things and persons that are remembered and their ability to educate beyond uh, an individual and a personal story. At the same time, it's this human scale, the small scale that is transcendent, significant, and can appeal to everyone's humanity. I'm sorry, we will have to leave it here. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Marco. We really are out of time. Thank you very much for your words. And now we will go directly to the last presentation before moving on to interesting debate. I hope I'll give the floor now to Jordi Bravasa, the historian and representing Memoria Democratica, Democratic Memory of the City Hall. Thank you. Speaking of institutionalization and bureaucracy, 
having uh, me speaking as the representative of the city council on this topic is, is interesting to hear. We are here to discuss on this micro monument on the Soperstein. And I think this meeting today is a reflection of the passing of time with the placement of this first stone until 2021. What was valid 30 years ago, this remembrance and memorial activism and civil activism and neighbor uh, activism has transformed. It has undergone a transformation. And it's true that behind the uh, laying of the Soperstein many times, uh, the institutions find it relatively comfortable because lying the Stolperstein, you go uh, you're passing the test of remembrance but not all cities not all Stolperstein are the same um, in Munich we heard why they are not placed in Navarra they have their own uh, laying in Valencia. There are tiles that also remember the uh, people killed by Nazis. And the question we have to ask ourselves, if Stolperstein are valid, no doubt, then the others are as well. Or is it rather perhaps that these cities don't have uh, the right remembrance policy because memory is always political and uh, conflictive. But if a city decides to remember they're deported in a different way, it's also valid. And we have to ask ourselves uh, whether it is um, attacking the deported or the relatives. And here, clearly, we're walking on a thin line and we have to strike a complex balance between the emotions and institutions have to show empathy naturally otherwise we won't even know what we who we are working for the struggle between empathy and the coherence of remembrance policies because if we want to have remembrance policies that are um, cross-sectional we have to find how to strike a balance and we have to do it in a way with that makes most sense in this sense, the city of Barcelona has its own policy, which the Topelstein precisely speaks of the possibility of these thousand Topelstein that could be uh, installed that have an impact uh, on what has been done. Uh, some a policy that has several objectives, recognition, remembrance, some pedagogy as well, uh, a, a will to explain, to give a context, to um, visualize, and also a, a willingness to um, make it part of the territory in the past. I'll show you some pictures to show you a part of the a signaling policy in our city. Here we have a, pl a plate of 2003 in memory of the victims of the bomb attacks in Barcelona, March 1938. It was modified some years ago with a smaller one, replaced by a smaller one that you can read better, more. It's more bold, perhaps. Changing the text, and it says, in memory of the victims of the bomb attacks of the uh, Franco's fascist regime, in a very visible place, giving context, paying tribute to the victims, wanting to repair and remind everyone of the victims and the uh, monuments to the victims and not making these invisible. Another example we have 
Here we have a plate. If you go to San Felipe Neri in Barcelona at the square, the idea was to change the plates and replace them with those that could be read instead of changing, in this case, the plate, which was a plate that, what the plate says is that this, it was, this square was bombarded by Franco's and fascist uh, air raids. It has this sign in three languages explaining this place, how it was bombed and you can do much more than what a small plate would do, explaining much more. So including the explanation, the pedagogy, the education of the event that happened. And here's another example in the Gothic quarters in Raval in Barcelona, where you see bottom right, a plate with the color resembling the pavement color saying, this is the house where 11 people died in the bomb attacks done by the Franco regime in 1938. On the top image, you can see where the plate lies. And you see this signaling, which is well visible. And it's it doesn't hide under the bar tables. To give you another example, this is another plate for Mercedes Nunez, anti-fascist fighter deported to Ravensbrück, who was born in this house, it says on the plate, or another victim murdered by the Gestapo in La Sante prison. So these are some examples paying tribute to some people who were deported. And as Rosa Duran was saying, there's a monument in the Citadella Park paying tribute to different victims or the memorial in Montjuic Cemetery or even in uh, Citadella Park uh, monument. Uh, in memory of gays, lesbians, and transsexuals who have been persecuted and repressed throughout history with this pink triangle. And finally, I wanted to explain this also, the square of in Cervantes Park paying tribute to the women of Ravensbrück with the rose, the rose of Ravensbrück. Usually in this park, there is a, um, a contest, a rose contest, and it also combines the roses with this tribute. It's obvious that we need to individualize and we would need an image that I forgot to mention of Pam de la Bota with all the victims, everyone murdered. So it is true that there is a need to individualize for sure. I also want to remind you that in Barcelona, there is one Stolperstein to, dedicated to President Luis Companys, and it's a controversial one. It's not rigorous. It's the one that you cannot stumble upon because it's always surrounded by fences. Also, there's a mistake. It says, here lived uh, Luis Companys at the front of the Palau de la Generalitat, the headquarters of the Catalan government where he never lived. So we must work on uh, being more rigorous in this sense. It also says, uh, here lived the honorable president. So then this is giving it a touch of hierarchy and I'm not saying we should not be paying tribute, but there is a uh, hierarchy uh, noted uh, of the victims indicating the rank. And precisely, the Stoppelsteine are quite cross-sectional and everyone is the same. 
in Mallorca, on the other hand, the stones are a better uh, signal. And also there's a political significance that is obvious, placing it in front of the Catalan government's headquarters and also the need to do the historical research so as to choose the place we know. Companys left the city for exile, uh, stopping at different towns and finally arrested. So there are different points in his voyage that would be susceptible to have a stopper stein. So we do have a need to be rigorous and to be coherent. In this image, we can see two blue memory plates and a stopper stein. No doubt all victims deserve a stopper stein and a stone and recognition, but it's true that the initiation of the project from the deported to the uh, concentration camps and the victims of Nazism opens up a universe that is not infinite, but it is quite big. And so at least we should think of how we would like to represent in the public space of the city, when we're speaking of remembrance activities, how we want to remember each of the victims. And one of the last Stolperstein in late in Catalonia, in Mataró, a uh, big tribute to someone, Juan Pairo, we could have put the stone somewhere else. So how do we avoid duplicity of the stones? And so this is not concluding anything, just uh, expressing the very many doubts, explaining how we decide to strike a difficult balance between empathy, rigor, and I won't say I won't say consensus because many times consensus is false, but empathy, rigor, and coherence. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, John V. Well, we've taken a little bit too much time. We have very little time for debate, but perhaps we could take a little bit of a break. Uh, let me open up the debate for everyone and write down uh, comments. Carlos Vallejo says, perhaps we should reflect on the opportunity of the Schulperstein for those victims of the Franco regime. Perhaps these stones are individualizing the memory at the expense of collective memory. With this, I open up the floor for debate. I hope you, someone, some of the speakers wants to take the floor now. I hope that the speakers will be able to address some of the topics that we've been discussed, uh, discussing so far, which were really interesting. Can you hear me well? Yes. Well, um, following the last uh, interventions. I'm very involved in the installation of Stolpersteiner in Manresa, among other things, because the uh, Stolperstein for my uncle was placed there. And I have to say the whole process was a very difficult because it all started with some research carried out by uh, university students. And at some point, a contradiction was uh, presented between a monument and a micro monument. And I have one to say, it shouldn't always, or it doesn't need to be like that. In Manresa, when these stones are placed, a monument is erected, a monument where all the names can be read and this is located at the most central uh, square in the municipality. And 
the visibility of this monument in this uh, highly central uh, location. It's a complement to the stone. And as Jordi Guichet was saying, and also Marco mentioned that, it is quite obvious that sometimes we value the memorial based on how much it costs. And sometimes the cost is really low. We cannot settle on a low cost. Sometimes if the cost is very low, we are expecting something else, right? And then uh, let me mention the variety of strategies implemented by the municipalities that are installing installing uh, stones. For example, there's a case where out of 40 deported, only 10 stones have been placed. Why is that? Well, because behind the installation of a stone, there's a lot of research, a lot of uh, people involved in the process and uh, somehow also institutional powers. In, I would say that the case of Barcelona is quite special and uh, we need a lot of reflection. Uh, we need much, well, many more discussions and we will see uh, how far the topography of the city will be shaped by that. Also, please bear in mind that the current shape of Barcelona is very different from uh, the Barcelona in the 1930s, for example. I suppose that in Barcelona, the involvement of the uh, neighborhood archives would be essential. And then we would need some families and relatives to be on board. In some cases, this involvement has taken up to several years. Also, the singularity of Republican victims of fascism must be visible. So, anonymity, anonymity hierarchy, all of these need to be somewhere, maybe not in the tile in itself, but we should not forget the reasons of their deportation. In the case of the Republicans, the reasons are quite homo homogenic. And I think this uh, should be set in stone somehow. In pedagogy, in pedagogy, they were not deported, you know, by chance. Jordi, Jordi Fon wants to say something. Well, from everything that I've been hearing so far, I think there's some confusion around uh, the piece of art of uh, Gunter Denmik and then signaling, right? I think that these two elements uh, complement each other. If municipalities want to adhere to Gunter Denmark, uh, art, Denmark's art, well, they should not forget about signaling the places accordingly. Gunter Denmark's proposal cannot be conceived, and I'm, I'm sure that Jordi Quiché is very well of that, you know, there are some procedure, procedures, right? So all of these have nothing to do with uh, artwork. Gunther Denmark does or makes art. 
So the parameters here should be completely different. That doesn't mean that art is not a mean of remembering and acknowledgement and acknowledging the torture and the pain of the victims of, of the Nazi regime. Then, you know, we tend to have a very negative perception of the institutions. And I believe that when living in a democracy, institutions represent citizens, or at least they should. Also, we've been talking about anti-monuments, right? And it seems as if anti-monuments come from uh, outside the institutional framework. Well, I do not agree with that idea. Let me think of Joachim Gerd or Stalet Jerk or uh, an art installation in the Paris Town Hall in 2005. Well, do you think that's institutional or non-institutional art? Hans Haag or Horst or Heisel? Just to give you some uh, German examples, do you think they would have been able to carry out and perform their art without institutional support? Well, I think that um, Sometimes we are a bit naive when talking about these kind of topics. I read somewhere in the chat, Carlos Vallejo was asking about the rigor on the installation of the Stolpersteiner. Well, all I can say is that when a Stolperstein is installed, uh, it is following a thorough research carried out by experts. There's also a dialogue, a conversation with them. There's, uh, we try to uh, find the relatives of the, of the deported and the stone is located in the location where this person last lived between 1936 and 1939. And since we are running out of time, that will be it from my side. Thank you. Well, actually, we uh, ran out, we completely ran out of time. We should actually wrap it up now so unless our speakers want to say something really really important i would say that uh, i've been reading the chat um, there are some interesting stories we have uh, someone from the basque country who's looking for a relative i think all these topics we could actually gather them and uh, discuss them later and outside this forum because we cannot solve them right now. So uh, thanks to all the panelists who have offered us a really interesting discussion. And as we said earlier, this is only the beginning of a very needed discussion. It is important to, for these voices to be heard voices that come not only from the institutions, but also from victims and relatives associations. And uh, well, we would now conclude with our second block. We have a 12 minute break, which is uh, needed by our technical staff. And we will uh, come back at uh, 6.50 for our third uh, round table. Thank you very much. Buenas tardes por tercera vez. Good afternoon again for the third time. Thank you for being here. Still connected with us in this so very interesting and diverse debate. Let's move on to the third panel titled Republican Memory Towards a Commemorative and Reconciliatory Gesture, Perspectives for Action. 
In this occasion, we will have a different dynamic. We have two speakers here live with me on the stage at a safe distance from Marta Marin and Marta Simo. The two Martas will have a conversation slash debate, and I will introduce them very quickly. Marta Marin Domine is graduate in literature, translation, and multicultural studies writer and professor of literature at Lohr University in Canada, director of the Center for Memory and Testimony Studies in Canada. And in, on the other side of the stage, Marta Simo Sanchez, a doctor of sociology, professor at the Autonomous University of Barcelona, Barcelona researcher in the Research and Sociology of Religion group, and member of the executive committee of the European Association for Holocaust Studies. So we will begin with a dialogue between Marta and Marta, and then we will have the two speakers with us connecting from Canada and Chile. So the two Martas have the floor. Thank you, uh, Catherine, for this opportunity to let us speak. And I'd li also like to thank the organizers. We thought that having a conversation would be interesting because as many of you will know, Marta Simo is one of the persons who made it possible to introduce the Soperstein in Catalonia, as we have heard in this afternoon. So this possibility of discussing the pros and the cons, which is what we will be doing, since we don't see this regularly, we really appreciate it. And we spoke with Marta Simo, we are colleagues and friends. We must bear in mind the context that this conversation takes place in on this micro monument, which is the original social context with the pandemic. We have seen Marta and myself, how the pandemic and the lockdown is being represented. And we've both been surprised at the use of the metaphor of Auschwitz and the Third Reich, referring to the suffering of being locked down. So it's very important because what we are discussing, in fact, is how this micro monument could be interpreted in a very different way, uh, in a way blended with other historical situation, leading to um, confusion in our memory. Also, a uh, recent law has been approved in Spain on historic memory, which we suppose will evolve and the actions we will be seeing. And so, although there are will be implementation of new monuments and we will see uh, in the background the effects of this law. The Stolperstein, as we've heard, have suffered, have undergone different modifications, but in terms of the other side of the coin, whether Stolperstein many times it establishes the historic uh, event as a continuum, even through the Third Reich itself, without considering that every event in history is specifically the one uh, brought about by the Third Reich and deportation is subject to different moments in this period that this happened in. So this uniformity makes this monument a monument potentially apolitical, which is troublesome in my opinion, because as we've heard this afternoon, reading on a stone that someone has been murdered in Auschwitz be, as a Jew, does not contain the same information historically as knowing that the person was uh, deported because of political reasons or because of um, their condition of homosexuals or anything. But a genocide is not the same as a political deportation 
we, I, I hope I'm not misunderstood because sometimes these remarks could be misinterpreted. I am not qualifying at all uh, their victims depending on the amount of pain they suffered, but the political categorization that they were subject to. So what I am worried about is this grouping historically uh, and this use of the Third Reich and Auschwitz. The resistances have been several. We heard in this meeting uh, Charlotte Nobloch referring to that. And this has occurred in other cities like in Paris where the Jewish community has not been keen on accepting uh, having a commemorative plate on the floor. So to begin this conversation, Marta, can we know if when you and Jordi Arrié started thinking that this micro monument, it would be appropriate to bring it to Catalonia? What? What did you think about the floor? Like what connotations did it bring uh, about to you? Thank you. Thank you also for the invitation. Before I answer your question, let me explain why it was decided that it could be a good monument for the victims, the Republican deported victims. The reason is because we were in a moment in which we were discussing the neutrality or not of the Spanish states. For years, uh, silenced and not recognized. So this Stolperstein monument were, indi were indicating this connection a connection that uh, with other monuments we would not find. So this on the one hand, I think you are absolutely right. And we have discussed this many times. The huge destruction of the Jewish people and the gypsy people and all the other groups persecuted by the Nazi regime must be explained appropriately. This is why I also think that Stolperstein help us educate in a way that we wouldn't do in a, in a different way. The fact that we can work so well with this micro monument through schools allows us to have all these debates. When we started this, we appreciated especially uh, the value from the schools approaching a micro monument, which oftentimes could replace memorial places. Not all schools or high schools can visit memorial places. Secondly, memorial places, I think still um, there are more. And so th these um, little stones would allow us to initiate this debate and give some context to what they meant and why we find it here and why we find it in Berlin and why we find it where we find it. So this on the one hand, now why on the floor? Well, in fact, this is very much related to the problem that Gunter had at the beginning because they tried to place it on the walls of facades of some houses. And there was enormous rejection to this, to the fact that that would devaluate the house, etc. And so it was decided to lay them in front of the house. This is the idea. On the other hand, it is true that uh, in terms of the Jewish communities, there is still an ongoing debate. And I think this monument and all monuments will be subject to debate because memory is, and this will be going on and on forever and ever. And this is what we must do. 
we must continue asking ourselves every time whether this is useful or not. And so I think that in this case, the Jewish communities themselves have discussed and debated whether they should or should not lay the stones. In Holland, for example, they have embraced them in Italy as well, in, in the majority of Germany as well. So it shouldn't be a debate. And always, as happened here, whenever it was done, these municipalities were promoted again. And what they take into account is what the municipality says, what the family says, what the citizens say uh, about whether to lay down the stones or not. And in Catalonia, in some cases, they have not been placed after done the study because there were complaints of very different nature. The fact that a place evaluates a building is interesting, as you said. I mean, in Europe, memory is a source of tourist attraction. But uh, when it uh, highlights a place of suffering or uh, of problems, then it's disturbing and it's not wanted. I want to speak about the semiotic uh, elements that the Stolpersteine contain as a work of art. It is also it's uh, one of its weaknesses. The original monument, as it's, it contains three verbal modes, which indicates a life here lived, so a period before the catastrophe, deported, the action, the barbaric action, politically barbaric, and a murder in a concentration camp. These three elements create a narration that acquires special significance in the, pa in the places where the deportation took place. So it indicates people who were taken from their homes, normal citizens. So the discovery by the passers-by helps remember not just the victim, also the action. And it also makes the country responsible. It helps as many other counter monuments of the 21st century to deglorify the past of the nations involved and to install the, the sense of uh, the acceptance of, of the guilt, the mea culpa. So this semiotic uh, thought that is not just remembering, it also indicates responsibility is something we don't see in, in, in Catalonia. I, I disagree. Well, let's just mention there's been a new element introduced, which is saying here lived, exiled, deported, murdered. So there are three historical moments, the historical moment of the life of the person who was victimized, the exile, another historical moment, and deportation. I think that this deviation, although it could be very interesting to mention, does not necessarily introduce any national responsibility. Again, it creates a blend of histories, which is controversial in my opinion. And it doesn't introduce uh, this in the story of the Germany of 20th century, the national responsibility, as we have discussed many times, the responsibility of Catalonia and Spain in terms of the memory of the gypsies or a, a colonial slavery. We don't accept these memorials. We ignore this. I, will, I suppose you will tell me the contrary, but <laughs> go ahead. You tell me what you think. Yes, I think it's the other way around. It allows us to connect precisely responsibility of the Franco government because we have to ask ourselves why this Stolperstein that we also find in Germany, what is the link 
for these to exist. What happened? Who was responsible? Not just this, the exiled people also introduces uh, another responsibility, the French government. So precisely, so long as it's not just one act of uh, political remembrance, but rather in be behind the scenes, there's a previous uh, and current and ulterior research work. We have to speak of the education of our youth and involve them in this. We need pedagogy. Without this, we are completely um, helpless. And I agree with you. And we've seen before this sense of between um, analyzing, trivializing, following a little bit the same idea we followed many years of not implementing appropriately the idea of what happens in every moment. I am taking into account, I'm sorry, we cannot hear the speaker's microphone. It is intriguing, but I consider this. Apologies, we cannot hear the speaker. Her microphone is not working. Something is wrong with the speaker's microphone. We cannot hear her. Okay, would you mind? We cannot hear her. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes, I wanted to insist on the fact that this memorial is an artistic uh, intervention. So it allows for many ways of reacting in front of the past. One of them is stumbling, which is stumbling not just physically, but also stumbling in uh, different senses. Stumbling because you stumble on a moment of uh, a mental stumbling that you did not expect, and you find history. I, I think the intention is to stumble on the stone. Since we mentioned it before, let's let's move on with a couple of things I wanted to speak of, Marta. I would dare say, perhaps I'm a little daring, but my question to you is, could it be that part of the acceptance of the Stolpersteine would be because perhaps it is the only monument that unites us visibly with the European history of Nazism in a country that for several reasons was isolated from this story. This could be positive, but it could also be negative. And I will leave it there because we, are part of the Europe of this period, but in a different way. And this difference, then here's another question I ask you, is couldn't this difference create the implementation of a memorial that has into account these elements, here lived exile, deportation, and murder? 
Well, very briefly, I think that these discussions are precisely fortunate right now. And just to conclude, when we talk about Barcelona, you know, the whole thing is much more complex. Our experience in very small villages, you know, has been a turning point. Because, you know, for those who do not live in big cities, we rarely have access to capitalities. And this would or could be translated in a widely unknown reality. Because you know how difficult and how silent this very specific memory is. So I agree. And I'll this is just, you know, my last thought. Of course, Barcelona deserves a dedicated deba debate, but I think that this is a very fortunate way to make this memory flourish. Well, thank you very much for this conversation. I'm sure you could just keep on and going on and on, but, um, uh, well, it was really interesting. Thank you. Now we will move on to our next speaker, Ricardo Brodsky. Welcome, Ricardo. He is joining us from Chile. He's uh, got to be a, a bachelor's degree in literature. He is uh, the museum director in Vicuña. He's also the former directive executive of the Memory Museum and the Museum Mr. Levy Licuña. And we are very thankful for uh, him joining us uh, today. Well, I would like to thank the uh, Department for Democratic uh, Memory of Barcelona for their invitation to be part of this discussion around the search of a memorial gesture that suits the city of Barcelona. I understand that the installation of the Stolpersteiner of the, of the artist Gunther Demnig is a reference in this conversation. And um, building on previous interventions, I would like to expand on certain ideas. I fully respect the people in the second panel who represent the victims and the relatives. And I'm fully aware of the fact that my perspective might differ from, they, from what they believe. I would like to make the most of the 10 minutes that I've been uh, allocated and well first of all the exemplarity of memory Deming's project I see it as a, a strongly emotional uh, gesture in order to repair oblivion or negation of millions of innocent victims of the Nazis and I say innocent, not as the opposite of guilty, but as victimized by their condition. The initiative was created in order to pay tribute to European Jews, but not only. And it confronted current citizens with the factical truth of the Holocaust and the crimes committed on the, the Nazi regime. With this simple gesture, we can get out of the mere statistical count of victims to give them back their names and humanity so that they are still present with us. It is a personal gesture for a person or a specific family. And this sign or gesture of empathy is universal. There's no call to fight. There's no call to certain ideologies, to classes, to national or religious beliefs. The only vindication here is human dignity. It is a pacifying gesture. It is not a memory to 
for revenge. This gesture has been replicated almost uh, limitless for the past few years, and it, it has become now a part of the landscape. It, it is at risk of banalization. And it is a phenomenon that materializes not only in a true industry of events or uh, memorial uh, mechanisms, but also in the obsessive re reiteration of a sacralized discourse of what we can say and we cannot say. And I recommend uh, reading The Monster of Memory by Yushai Sarit in this respect. Also, this is a trap for banalized memories a memory in which we assimilate the facts of the past in the present, or a literal memory, which is so rich in detail that we lose perspective on the exemplarity of a traumatic experience. Second point, homogenic memory and empathy. In my opinion, there should be many different ways to commemorate be it through public monuments or artistic initiatives. There's no one right way to do it in Argentina, in Chile, in Peru and Colombia. Just to name the realities I'm familiar with. Public art has played an important role when it comes to remembering and especially when interpreting a traumatic experience. I would like to share with you some pictures. This is the Pain Memorial. This is an example of a popular memory practice. It remembers an, the assassination of 70 peasants and in their memory, this, uh, you know, group of trees were planted. Every family of these 70 uh, murdered people were asked to make a mosaic like this. So on the floor of these uh, woods, you'll find 70 pieces of mosaic made by the families of the victims. Another example are the remembrance stones. They are very important in the sculpture, the, in the sculpture called the eye that cries in Lima. As you can see in this sculpture, this sculpture is surrounded by thousands of stones depicting the names of the victims. It has not been accepted, exempt from um, controversy. Because among the different names, you'll find the names of uh, members of supporters of Sendero Luminoso together with the names of the victims of the very own organization, Sendero Luminoso. So this monument has agitated people, actually, because contrary to the author's initial uh, aim, it doesn't trigger empathy, but conflict. And we've seen several episodes of people actually doing some graffiti or uh, throwing paint over the monument. So we should actually ask ourselves, how can we uh, build more empathy with a memorial? Memorials are very sensitive and subject to controversy. In that sense, and I'm going to differ a bit from what I've been hearing until now. This is a kind of artistic initiative that was 
born to remember the victims of the Nazis. And it should remain in this area, in this scope. It should refer exclusively to this particular historic trauma and memory. And we should try to avoid to make it as a motif, a kind of a motif in the literary uh, sense, to remember all the victims of the, in the 20th century in a homogenic way. I'm saying this because when public art is replicated uh, without any kind of criticism, with a different language, well, it is a, diff is, it is a way to reiterate a politically correct narrative, just using a different language. This could be the greatest attack to memory, the way or the path to oblivion. Where, where it is powerless, uh, unable to talk to our fellow contemporary uh, citizens. Contrary to that, there's artistic creativity that has an impact and succeeds in conveying the original message. Two examples. Well, let me say three examples. The geometry of consciousness from or by Alfredo Jar in Santiago. It is, of course, symbolic art. Through these cut out images that are projected to the infinite, the artist wants to show that the victims of dictatorship in Chile are all of that, all of us, and that the, the consequences of the dictatorship still uh, remain among us. The second example is the reconstruction of the portrait of Pablo Minguez in, uh, the in a river in Buenos Aires. It is very literal art, but despite this, we cannot see the face of the person because the person is looking uh, out to the sea. I'm not saying that there are better ways than others to represent or to commemorate. Another project, Acción Medular, was made by Carlos Prats, by Fer Fernando Prats, who lives in Barcelona, as a matter of fact, and it is a homage, a homage to Carlos Prats González. And it reproduces a fragment of the letter sent by this general, by Carlos Prats. Regarding the institutionalization of memory, Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I know that you have still many things to say, but you've actually used up your 10 minutes. I'm going to be very quickly. I think that the official memory uh, is made up of very different parts. And I th think that these uh, monuments, official monuments, try to build the official memory, the frustrated memory, for example, in Colombia. The case of the Museum of Memory in Colombia. It was impossible to close uh, the, or to put an end to, to the dialogue through the museum. So we re always required consensus with society, even though it's at the minimum level. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. And 
of course it's very valuable to gather your inputs and insights from different parts of the world and i'm sorry that i had to interrupt you but otherwise we won't have time for the q a session now we're going to give the floor to our last but not least uh our last speaker he's uh joining us from canada robert jan van pelt he's a He's got a PhD in history and architecture. He focuses on the Holocaust. He um, studied uh, cultural studies in Waterloo, and he's also a member of the Babin Yar Holocaust Memorial in Kyiv in the Ukraine. It is a great pleasure to have him again with us after we welcomed him and our series of dialogues in 2018. He's going to talk about the genocide stumbling over the civil uh, stone. So, well, we are very keen on listening to what he has to say in the last uh, presentation of the day. You have now the floor. Uh, Catherine, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, good. And you can see me too, I hope. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to share a screen. I just would like to, to thank you very much to, to involve me in this in this discussion. Of course, being the last person, it means that uh, I, 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 I must say that many of the points that I want to make have already been made, especially Ricardo's last uh, presentation is very close to my thing. But in fact, because I was the last person, uh, I thought actually what I wanted to do is give you my view of the Stolperstein, a, a, a more emotional, more personal essay. So I'm going to take you through a, a set of slides. And uh, these slides uh, uh, basically is, um, yeah, my view. Uh, how, how, how do I live with these things, really? So um, it begins in 2014. My wife Miriam and I we uh, we live in um, we live in uh, the center of Berlin. I'm doing research. She's doing research there. And uh, on my daily walk from where we live, close to the Nordbahnhof, to the uh, Staatsbibliothek and the uh, Unter den Linden, um, uh, basically I have to cross Oranienburger Straße. And uh, uh, the Oranienburger Straße, of course, very famous for the, uh, the, the facade of the synagogue that still exists. The body of the synagogue was destroyed during the Second World War. But then also uh, to the right at the blue dot is the intersection of the Hamburger, uh, the, the, the Große Hamburger Straße and the Oranienburger Straße, which actually is a point I passed every day. And this is very close to a major uh, orphanage, uh, an old age home. Um, uh, uh, during the uh, time of the Holocaust, which were places of demonstrations. So this is exactly the intersection, thanks to Google Earth. And, uh, and every day I passed these five uh, Stolpersteine uh, uh, for Philip Kosova, Gisela Kosova Herzberg, and children Eva Rita, Elise, and Uri Aron. These were photos I made at the time. Uh, here lived Eva Rita Kosova, Jahrgang, a year 1932, deported 1943 to Theresienstadt, uh, murdered in Auschwitz. So here, uh, a picture of, the, uh, of Gisela, Philip, and Eva. So Eva is the, uh, uh, is the young girl commemorated. Uh, in uh, the last of the Stolperstein, of course, this is the, the three of the five family members, and here Eva and then Alice in 1938. So uh, one of the nice things that we can do today is actually you have the record of the Stolperstein and you can go online and you can actually find uh, the stories quite also thanks to the, uh, to the work of, 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 the, of the foundation. So this is then the Theresienstadt ghetto, uh, as it was in 1943, where uh, the family is deported and just uh, uh, the conditions within the Theresienstadt ghetto. This was hardly a nice place to be. It was an antechamber to Auschwitz, overcrowded, full of, uh, of death and disease. And then ultimately uh, the place where um, where the family was sent to Auschwitz. This is actually a road sign from 1940 that we have uh, at this moment. 
uh, at an exhibition in uh, New York, but which was started out in Madrid, organized by a firm from San Sebastian in Basque Country, uh, Musealia. And, um, uh, and, 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 and then, of course, this is then the Auschwitz that we are more familiar with, uh, as drawn by David Oler, a former uh, Sonderkommando, in 1945 after his return to Paris. So uh, this is then the Stolperstein for Eva Redita, Rita Kosova. And in some way, all of that, what I try to touch on in a few more images, is encompassed in these few words. Um, now, uh, when we are looking at Stolperstein, uh, as was already observed in the Netherlands, they have, they have become quite popular too. Here in Amsterdam, these are Stolperstein at Merwedeplein 37. This is the house where the Frank family lived from 1934 until uh, July, June 1942, before they went into hiding at the Prinsengracht. And here we have then the Dutch version uh, of Otto, uh, Frank, Edith, uh, Frank Hollander, and Margot, and Anne Frank, Anne Frank at the bottom right. Now, here we have a photo of the Merwe de Plain uh, as it was in uh, around 1938. It was quite well known because it was the first skyscraper in the Netherlands, the first high rise residential building. The Frank family lived to the right where more or less the car is parked, and they lived there at the third floor. So here we have the Stolperstein, and I just would like to put them into context. Uh, here we have again Google Earth. We're looking now at the uh, at the Merve de Plan. It's a triangular uh, kind of square uh, surrounded on two sides by buildings. You have the skyscraper to the right. And uh, look at this uh, this uh, very recognizable uh, piece of, uh, of of urban reality in Amsterdam now you know from from the sky. This is more or less when you fly into Schiphol, you will be able to see that to see then Amsterdam as it is today from the air. Uh, there's a very recognizable urban form from the 17th century, but here we have one of the most infamous maps ever made in the Netherlands. And of course, the Netherlands is very well known for its cartography. The city of Amsterdam, um, without much pushing from the German occupation authorities in 1941, created a map of the, uh, of the Jews in the city. It's called the dot map, the Stippen map. Uh, and every dot represents uh, 10 Jews. And uh, this, was, uh, this, was, this was undertaken by the civil authorities, again, not by the German occupiers. And so this was a time that, uh, uh, that the Jews were being pushed out of civil society. They were being uh, characterized as people who had arrived there as beggars who had in some way taken possession of the society, that they would have taken positions of power, which in fact was not true at the time. Uh, this was 1941, the same year that the movie The Eternal Jew um, uh, was shown in the Netherlands, which of course talks about the conspiracy, it talks about the, uh, the, the, the danger uh, that Jews uh, basically uh, create for civil society. This is the Dutch version of it. It was a time that Jews were not allowed anymore to uh, sit on park benches, to go to cinemas, to uh, swim in swimming pools, they were kicked out of Jewish children, children out of schools, and so on. And it's a time that, uh, that, 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 that every Jew is being counted and hence can be represented. The center, the old center of Jewish Amsterdam is the red dot. It is in the city center. This is where Jews had been settled since the early 17th century. And here we have an important place, the entry from the less Jewish part into the Jewish part, the Blue Bridge, it's called. And we have here a photo, a montage created by the Anne Frank House, where we see on the left, uh, this neighborhood uh, marked as the Jewish quarter, both in German and in Dutch. And on the right, we see the contemporary situation. Uh, and the Anne Frank House is doing these kind to create these kind of postcards to show that the reality in 1941 and the reality 80 years later is in fact a continuum and that we should consider ourselves responsible for what happened 80 years ago. 
I'm now going to look at another uh, address, uh, 59 New Kaisersgracht in Amsterdam, a residential quarter. You see again a lot of Jews living around there. And uh, we're looking here at what we could say cynically one tenth of a dot and her dog sitting on a chair on the pavement of an Amsterdam canal in uh, uh, June 1942. In fact, her name is Frautje Blitz Krenkramer. She's 76 years old. She sits on a chair on the pavement at 59 New Kaisersgracht, 1942. But of course, all that matters to the Germans is the fact that she's a Jew. Since 1941, the Germans didn't recognize actually anymore the individual identity of Jews in the Netherlands or for that matter anywhere else. They only existed as a collective. The Germans would not deal with individual Jews, they would only deal with the Jewish council. So she was in fact nameless. This was all that mattered to the Germans, that she was a Jew. This was the only name that mattered. This, by the way, is the star from my grandmother. So when we now go back to the south, the quarter of Amsterdam South, and we go back to the skyscraper right there, we have now a photo that shows the roundup of Jews in 1943. Jews who've been taken out of the skyscraper and other buildings uh, th that are there, they are waiting on actually this little parquet for the deportation to Westerbork and then Auschwitz. I'm now going to look at another site in the same neighborhood and show a scene that many people would have seen. Jews who are now being taken from the place where they waited to the streetcar that will bring them to the station that brings them to Westerbork and Auschwitz. And what is, I think, quite important to remember is that this man is carrying everything that remains of his former life. 20 kilos is all you're allowed. So you're going to be sent on the train to an unknown destination. And all that you have done, all that you have, that, that you have earned in your life, all that you have inherited is now going to be in, a, in two, two bags. Or well, here we have the photo by the Anne Frank House. Today and yesterday, 1943, 2021. And this woman carries everything that remains of her life. So we're now going to look at this third point in this neighborhood. And this is one of the most unique photos of the Holocaust in the Netherlands. It's taken from the third floor of an apartment, a good Dutch apartment. People have just had their tea. You see the two teacups sitting on the ledge. And they're photographing Jewish neighbors who have been taken out of their home. They've been kicked out of their home, now waiting for the walk to the streetcar that will bring them to Auschwitz. And what, of course, is particularly interesting is when we look in detail is the non-Jewish neighbors who are watching. It's not only that we get the sense of watching from the apartments, thanks to the uh, to teacups, but also the act of non-Jewish neighbors watching what is happening yeah this is being witnessed you see that people are sitting on the pavement and for me this is actually what is the key piece the key piece why i think actually that in the case of the netherlands actually the stone works is because they're in the pavement at the place where the people who had just been kicked out of their house had to wait for Auschwitz. In some way, for me, what it really marks, what these stones really mark, is actually that moment. It's not for me a generalized statement about here lived for 10, 20, 400 years this family, but here waited for 10, 15, 20 minutes after their lives as they had known it had come to an end. These people, it marks actually a moment of rupture, which will be followed by the apartments being emptied, by the uh, well-known uh, uh, moving company, Mr. Pulse of Mr. Pulse. And then afterwards, 
in houses that were in the old center in the winter of 1944-45, the houses were demolished, largely demolished, because the Dutch were cold and the winter was cold and the Dutch needed firewood. This was the reality that a few survivors found when they returned in 1945. So this is where the picture was taken at the Vesperstraat. This is those houses, Jewish houses, demolished by Dutch people, not by Germans. This is a book, Grass Grows in the Vesperstraat, and it basically gives what, what happened to the few survivors when they came in and they not only knew that all of their family members had been deported and murdered, but even their neighborhood had been physically destroyed. So this is how it looks right now. It's at the very place where the Dutch have decided to put the new memorial to the Holocaust, a big name memorial, its second memorial, like the uh, memorial in Berlin. This is the official story to remember Le Gazor. And it is basically can again be seen, it is to be seen from the sky, from God's perspective, the words. A labyrinth, of course, designed by Daniel Liebeskind. And uh, I don't think that we all would necessarily want Daniel to do uh, all Jewish memorials in the world, but uh, I think this is, is, is not that bad. 105 names about to be opened uh, in this year. So, the red dot is the place of the memorial, the place where the houses were pulled down of the Jews, and the blue dot is a place where this one-tenth of a dot lived. Up to the moment that Frauke Blitz Kleinkramer, born in 1866, was deported to Auschwitz to be killed on her day of arrival. So she only has two more months to live when this photo was taken. So for me, ultimately, the, the, the Stolperstein have this power if we, if we combine it with these kinds of documents to bring us back to those terrific moments when being a Jew was a death sentence. Being born a Jew was a death sentence. Which then, of course, raises the question, what does this have to do with that? Are we actually talking about historical experiences that, in fact, we can commemorate in the same manner? I just leave it as a question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert Dian. Muchísimas gracias por esta. Thank you so much, Robert Dian, for your images and your moving narrative, which leaves us with many questions in our mind. And I think it's time to move to the debate between the four speakers we have today, Marta, Marta, Ricardo, and Robert Jan. And also consider there are some comments and questions from the audience that we will get in writing. So, we have a very important question in our minds and that final image. And we're not here to find solutions, obviously, but rather to debate. I think we've heard many things. We are hearing many things that give us different perspectives. And what I'm interested in this debate is the debate it's itself and not so much blaming one side or the other, or this is better than that. We've also heard very much about the difference between art and not art, because Stolpersteine are a signaling 
done by an artist, which is different from the signaling on behalf of the uh, municipality or the state or the government. And also different ways in which we value and approach. What do we think? What do we feel during the whole day today? Given this small object, many people have different opinions and feelings and the artistic codes they leave us with this question what does this or that mean what does one or another thing represent on to you yes there's translation it's always on I agree with Robert Jan, who I want to greet kindly from Barcelona. A year ago was my last trip to Canada, and I'm very happy to see him here. I fully agree with the question Robert Jan is asking. In his presentation, we see very clearly the ability these stones have to make present an absence. This effectiveness is less when we speak of a Republican memory. And as I was listening to all my fellow speakers, I was thinking of something that sets the difference. Robert Young said something we oftentimes forget, at least in our cultural context. In the case of Jewish people, they have been persecuted, persecuted because of their qualities, um, which means that everyone has been a victim, even those who were saved. Now, in terms of the Republican memory, that wants to commemorate the Stolperstein, it's different because victims of the Franco regime, there were from here that did not, were not exiled. The Republicans, anti-fascists, uh, anti-Francos oh, were uh, victims, but I was thinking of that they were exiled and deported, but there were many people here who stayed here. The Stolperstein are not commemorating these persons who stayed. So these are my remarks, yeah. We also have some questions from the audience. Jordi speaks of some resistances. Uh, for example, in a municipality, there was a plate to be laid, and the family opposed it because of how they had experienced their condition of victims. They felt left aside by the institutions. And also, a question to Marta. You spoke of Catalan responsibility, but what responsibility were you referring to? I was saying that the counter monument that was uh, that took place in Germany in the 21st century is placing a lot of responsibility in the country that you live in. And this addressed at the new generations that have nothing to do with the with this history. I think it's very daring. And here, nowadays, when we see a plate, a cobblestone, we don't 
think of our own responsibility as a person belonging to this nation that was responsible. So I was th saying that this ability that uh, the stone has to create like a sense of collective blame or guilt is lost here. And in Catalonia, this um, self-blaming memorial does not exist when we speak of the discrimination suffered by gypsies or other ethnic groups or slavery. I still, I still believe that we can still uh, take part of this exercise. We are moving, uh, we are accepting this responsibility as, as a country in the Franco regime. And this is why we, I also think that as victims, specific victims of the Republicans, I think it is worth to have uh, this stone that combines the two together in uh, something that, in my opinion, and also supported by the studies carried out, uh, uh, well, reflects the collaboration of the Franco regime with the Nazi regime. And that's why Stolpersteine are worth, are worth it. And uh, this is something that we've been discussing for ages now, right? But it's not, you know, just about the Stolperstein here and now. It's about the victims who suffered uh, from a genocide. It is the Jewish people. And of course, all of these elements cannot be reflected in one single monument. I think that it allows us to debate and to talk about it, to talk, talk and reflect about the message these stones are conveying. And why here a family does not want a Stolperstein? Well, it is precisely because they believe uh, that they haven't been awarded any kind of acknowledgement until now. So this is something that should actually, uh, you know, make us think. I don't know if this is possible with other monuments. I, I, I really don't know. Can I, can I add something? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think I, I, one, one thing which, which I have missed in the discussion today uh, and, and I think it might be good to reflect on it, is that I think that any memorial that that uh, looks at a the fate of an individual uh, ought to work at two levels simultaneously. The first one is it needs to, in some way, uh, uh, create a memorial to that individual, but it also has to address that community in which to which that uh, to which that uh, that uh, individual belonged. And so what you have in the case, uh, and I think this makes us somewhat of a difference, that in the case of a memorial for a genocide, by definition, even if there is to a certain level a reconstruction, some kind of reconstruction of that community that suffered a genocide after the, uh, the, that set of events is over, that, that, uh, that simultaneously the memorial has to deal with the, the, the individual and the absence of the of the community that isn't there anymore. And you can say more or less that Europe is now a continent without Jews. This is from the Jewish perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, in, in 1939, 70% of the Jews of the world lived in Europe. Mm -hmm. Right now, I think it's less than, it's 8% or something like that, or even less. And it is, it is, it's declining for obvious reasons, uh, thanks to anti-Semitism, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So the genocide that the Germans triggered and that their allies helped to, really, to, 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 to fulfill has been successful in Europe. Mm -hmm. From a Jewish perspective, it's totally successful. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is why the Stolpersteine, when you take the Stolpersteine in a city like Amsterdam or Berlin or something like that, mm -hmm. you cannot say that German Jewry ever returned. It's always read within that context of the absence of the community. 
itself. Now, in, I really hope for Catalonia or for Spain or whatever context you take, that while the Republican the individuals who were the Republican victims of the Franco regime died and are absent, that in fact many of the ideals of the Republic are alive and well. That in fact there is a continuity in the present civil society of that. Mm -hmm. And so this is where I think that the, the question of the Stolperstein, the, the appropriateness or not, because of the presence of a, I would say, a robust social democratic, et cetera, et cetera, presence in, uh, in both the, in the region and in the country itself, that, that, that one might think about that relationship, I think, in greater detail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ricardo. Ricardo, tienes la palabra. Querías. Ricardo, you have now the floor. Do you want to say something? Stolpeine. I believe that the Stolpersteine have a great impact, indeed. They are gra great means of commemoration and memory. I agree in what have, has been said. It is important that each and one of the victims has his or her own stone. But I also think it is difficult to gather all the victims over the 20th century. And I think it's also difficult to recover all of these victims. Because in doing so, we somehow assimilate one experience with the other. And these experiences cannot be easily assimilated. We cannot desacralize the experience of the Holocaust. Of course, it is related and has similarities to other uh, genocides. But the commemoration in this case must have its own nature, its own character. This is my opinion. And I think that this initiative is tremendously impactful, right? It has great potential. Well, that, that's, my, that's what I believe. Do you want to say something else? Well, we've been receiving questions and doubts from the audience. No, the, the question, what is the problem in Barcelona? Why are Stolperstein not installed here? Well, we've been going around this question, but uh, we haven't solved it yet. I think it is quite clear now that there are many uh, pieces of the puzzle to, to bring together, and it's uh, not an easy decision, to, not an easy decision to make. And also the question of why do we mix and combine uh, Nazism and Republicanism at the same time? This question that we received from the audience. Yes, it is a question that uh, we've seen during the debate, right? The idea of expanding, opening this debate to a different kind of victims. We are asking whether that's possible and if so, how? Well, I do have a different question myself and this is something mentioned by Rosa Toran earlier. earlier. Jewish victims who were born here what happens with them? Is it necessary to install a Stolperstein for them or not? Also, we have two people of two 
gypsies uh, that were originally from Barcelona. So again, it's this discussion around uh, who's a national, who is not a national, who was born here, who lived here. So there's a series of elements that must be taken into account, but I believe that is precisely this variety, these myriad factors that enable to see how complex that moment was, a moment that to which the Spanish uh, dictatorship also contributed to. And uh, why do we talk about these two topics, Rep Republicans and the Nazi regime? Well, because they coexisted for a period of time and we don't teach them as two uh, joint elements here. Well, I would like to conclude our third panel Thank you very much indeed. Thanks to the panelists. And what we're going to do next is we're going to take a 10 minute break. And after that, we come back together and we'll draw some conclusions and the wrap up the closure of this intense conference. And thank you for all your ideas and contributions. Thank you very much indeed. Última, última bienvenida o último retomar contacto con el público que está Last en la point of contact with the audience still connecting with us, appreciating so much that we still have participants waiting for me to summarize, which is a task I have to do when I find most difficult. There will be, I'm sure, a more in-depth summary a more thoroughly thought and ensuring that everything that we discussed today will be put together in a document that we can have a look at if you're interested in. First of all, I want to thank the speakers, of course, who have I found most interesting to hear the different standpoints in the different panels, uh, adding voices more than finding solutions, which was not the intention, but rather from a, as we said in the beginning, from this interest in the project, the project of the Stolpersteine and the requests that are on the desk of the council office, the role that that micro monument could have in the context of Barcelona. Since we have had several things on the table, for example, originally this project of Gunter Devnik is a memorial uh, project. Sorry, I'm told I have to look at the camera. Looking at uh, national discourse, what happens when we institutionalize this? Here we heard about the the fact of not demonizing institutions, not at all, but rather the question is when an act goes from being an individual act of a civil society to a more institutionalized act, and what is the, the role of the individual and family initiative in the context of that institutionalized act. And we've seen that it's a matter of uniting which institutions try to do, uniting the individual efforts and the institutional efforts. And it is democratic to look for 
ways of co memorializing the different victims. And this was something we discussed in the second panel. Who are the victims? How we define them, how we see them, how we approach them. And this was something that we discussed here. We also asked about the relationship between institutions and groups. In the case of the uh, Stolpersteine, the stones, how to keep these stones with that invisible nature that they have. It's a very small, minute monument that you encounter by chance. In the best case scenario, it's a very small monument, which does not is not exposed in the public space in an, a very visible manner, but rather it's a micro monument that you encounter by chance in the city and suddenly you find a family and personal history of a person who lived in that moment in that context and suddenly you start thinking you come out of your daily routine and you and you find another reality. And this is something we have seen. Some think it's a way of reflecting and commemorating, withholding and thinking. Some find it very appropriate, but others, as we heard, Miss Knobloch, do not find it appropriate. And so the difficult thing is that we will never agree on whether one way or another of commemorating is the one that everyone uh, is appealed to and everyone agrees to. It's also something we've seen in the debate. We will not have uh, the final answer to this question. We also heard very much about individual and collective. What is collectivity versus the vis-a-vis uh, -vis the destination of an individual victim, the search of a family, or the search of the whole collective, the whole group? This is subject to debate, and I hope in further debates we could found, find out more also. Something we heard about, is it appropriate to expand the project of the Stolpersteine in the commemoration of other victims of repressive violence and combine the commemorative codes? Here we've seen there are different opinions. The artist himself There's the uh, new project of Remember Stones changing perhaps the color or the texture or the language contained. It's also a possibility available. And another question, how to achieve a universal dimension versus an ethical uh, dimension Philosophically speaking, in terms of the passers-by, we didn't discuss this too much, but it's also an important question. In a city, the passers-by, who do they encounter when they encounter that uh, notion of the commemorated victims? How do we connect if it's uh, the citizen of a city we live in or a city we know? or rather if it's a city we're just visiting by chance, or rather is it a universal thing that affects us all in the same way as we've heard in the last presentation by Robert Jan van Pelt in Amsterdam and Germany in general, encountering even if you have a di very different ideology, the 
esa plantación en la calle. Uh, the um, taking away the Jewish population from that town in, in that in that manner has an impact and it is universal. And the, the role of the cities also is very important. What is the role of cities among them, uh, Barcelona, creating commemorative fabrics? What is the role of the municipalities? How to respond? to these commemorative actions that a city has. Each city has their local memories and their need to uh, do it in a more universal way. I think here we have a, a message that we can take away from the debate we heard today, besides the fact that we saw that it is possible to debate, to have a debate format where not everybody agrees with one another, and still yet we Perhaps with the doubts brought about by what others say, we are taken to reflect even further on the topic. And I suppose that um, on behalf of the City Hall and the Office for the Memory that has commissioned this debate, the idea is to continue discussing, looking for more questions and more answers, and thinking that a policy that could come from some organizations and the place of Stolperstein in Catalonia on the one hand could even coexist easily and very appropriately with other ways of commemorating such as uh, other commemorations um, organized by the city of Barcelona, the plural nature of this and of our thoughts and our feelings in collective memory, which is the memories we all share, as I said, and as we heard in the second, in the second panel, I am part of this group of people who believe that there are people in a city like Barcelona who don't, or not originally from there, but who do connect with the local memory and then make it even more theirs than some of the locals who were born there originally. So all these things are present. And I think the debate has shown that there is an ex a lively exchange globally. We have heard voices from other continents and we heard that the fight for collective memory and remembrance is something that touches us all And I think in that sense, we have achieved a very open discussion in the chat box we've heard and in the questions we got. There are many doubts. Some people heard things they did not expect. Some people are left with important questions and unanswered questions with yet more questions, but it's something nevertheless which is one of the intentions, in fact, of this uh, meeting today to continue the conversation, looking for at a moment in which we have friction where society is either black and white and we don't find common ground in which to discuss. If we have different standpoints, we must find common ground in which to coexist. And here's the last point I want to mention, the pedagogy, education. We have seen, and it's clear in this debate that teaching the younger ones, bringing them into a debate about their own history is also something that from the 
office, councillor's office of memory and the institutions and the citizens we have to foster and we have to ensure we have more formats like the one we had this evening with the advantage of having been able to speak with people from all over the world as we had to have this in a digital format. And I want to thank again the people who I would have liked to see so much in person and not being here in this stage practically empty. I want to thank all the speakers. I want to thank the organizers, the technicians, everyone who has made this possible. Thank you all so much for that support you gave me and the audience who were here for five hours, hearing voices, discussing, but not giving answers on something about commemoration in the city of Barcelona, but I'm sure this debate will take us a step further. So we will leave it here. There will be a summary. There have been requests of Um, there might be some questions that might be uh, and sent over to the speakers and we will see putting together uh, the voices in that debate, which is something we've only just begun. Thank you so much. Good evening. And thank you again.